I, there's pink cards in the back in the ante room. Make sure you fill out a pink card so you can get up to me so I know to call your name and have you come testify. We have short, shorter lists. No, not that I see yet. All right, it being the appointed time at 9 o'clock, I'm going to call the committee into, into order. Um, we'll start the committee by the, saying the Pledge of Allegiance. If you please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty, and justice for all. So make sure everybody's at the right committee hearing, which I'm sure you are. This is the committee to study the policy of medical interventions and immunizations. I'm going to start the committee meeting off the same way I've started the last four off, is just to let people know there are approximately 30, 32 bills that have been filed uh, here at the State House this year relative to the conversation of, on four topics, and that is COVID, masking, mandates, and vaccinations. There are 30 current bills pending. Here you go, Tim. There are 30, 33 bills that are currently pending. One of these is not. Wait. Oh, this one. Looks like it's not. There you go. Thank you. All right. I'm going to run through the titles just real quick so everyone's familiar with the bills that are existing. So if there's anything, any of them that are of interest of you, um, you can go look them up further. Some of the language is not online yet. Um, OLS, the Office of Legislative Services, will have the uh, bills probably online by first of December, mid-December at the latest before our January start date for the next session. So again, I'm just going to run through the titles of these bills. Relative to requiring the COVID-19 vaccination for school attendance. Requiring the New Hampshire Attorney General to empower, impanel a COVID-19 grand jury to investigate events related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Relative to the state's grants for researching the effects on the human body of the COVID-19 vaccine. Elim requiring post-secondary institutions to accept religious and medical exemptions from vaccine requirements, requiring an audit of the New Hampshire Vaccine Association, making the state vaccine registry an opt-in program relative to the exemptions from vaccine mandates, relative to the exemptions from school vaccine mandates, relative to students attending public schools that mandate the wearing of face masks without emergency orders in place, Limiting the authority of the Department of Health and Human Services to mandate vaccinations and relative to the quarantine costs. Relative to state enforcement of the federal vaccine mandates. Relative to medical mandates adopted by employers. Relative to employee protections from COVID-19 in the workplace. Prohibiting the state and local governments from adopting certain mandates in response to COVID-19 and prohibiting employers and places of public accommodation from, discriminate, from discrimination. Relative to the procedure of withdrawing from the vaccine registry, requiring the Department of Health and Human Services to maintain certain records relative to the vaccine registry, expanding the prohibition against discrimination based on the individual's election not to participate in the state vaccine registry, prohibiting the Department of Health and Human Services from requiring vaccine passports for services, prohibiting the higher education institutions receiving state funds from requiring face masks and COVID-19 vaccinations for attendance, Proclaim, uh, proclaiming the first Monday of March as COVID-19 Victims and Survivors Day, relative to the limited liability for personal injury resulting from or related to exposure to COVID-19, relative to unemployment benefits for employees terminated for refusing to comply with vaccine mandates, relative to unenforceability of non-compete non agreements upon termination of an employee for non-compliance with, vac with a vaccine mandate, relative to vaccine mandates for government contractors, relative to financial responsibility for employer-mandated COVID-19 testing of employees, prohibiting the school districts from mandating COVID-19 vaccines for school attendance, prohibiting certain employers from requiring COVID-19 vaccination as a condition of employment, 
relative to eligibility for workers' compensation for adverse reaction for mandatory COVID-19 vaccinations, requiring the full Food and Drug Administration approval of vaccines relative to COVID-19 health and safety policies at the New Hampshire Performing Arts venues, relative to school district policies on facial masks and students in schools, and lastly, requiring an independent audit and needs assessment regarding COVID-19 preparedness and long-term care facilities, nursing homes, the veterans' homes. Sorry, I can't read the whole thing. And making an appropriation, therefore. So those are the 32 bills that are currently pending before the legislature uh, that have been filed, were filed in September. Um, those bills will all get public hearings um, and they'll be assigned to the appropriate committee. Some of those are Senate bills and some are not. Can everybody, well, I don't see it. Anyway, can one of you guys go find one of the audio guys, see if they can figure out what that feedback's from. Anyway, so we're gonna open up public testimony um, on this, again, the, the task of this committee is, the, is to look at the policy of medical intervention and immunizations as it relates to gov governmental policies um, and making a recommendation uh, based on our, our, um, our committee and our study here. So first up will be Representative Tim Horgan. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. So I'm Resident Timothy Horrigan. So I'm on. Um, so I wanted to speak up uh, for the vaccines. I mean, I realize uh, not everyone can take them. Not everyone will want to take them. But I think um, something that's been very much lost in the debate, ironically, is the fact that the virus is extremely dangerous, vastly more dangerous than the than the vaccines. They're not 100% safe, but nothing in life is 100% safe. But if we um, if we hadn't developed the vaccines, if we hadn't taken um, the various emergency measures, which I think should have been tougher, um, we would have uh, we would have lost even more people than we did. And as it is, this is the uh, biggest catastrophe in terms of number of people killed since the Civil War. Um, and so, one of the even though we're sort of in denial about it, it's a, it's a major catastrophe worldwide. And I happen. I, uh, I, I happen to represent uh, Durham, which has a number of, uh, a number of uh, Chinese residents from, from China because of, uh, they're studying at UNH, and they, um, their country took it much more seriously. I mean, they're very different from us, and it's an oppressive country. I don't want to live there, but they, uh, you know, they were very aggressive about it, and what they did, uh, whatever else you might think about the way they do things, it, was, uh, it, it, it worked, you know, like, which is, you know, you know, nearly universal testing and um, and rolling out the vaccines quickly and stuff. So um, I have I have uh, several bills. That I guess you could describe as pro-vaccine bills. Um, there's um, two bills about the Medical Freedom and Immunizations Act, I think, which uh, one, which I'm just co-sponsoring with a member from Keene, which just carves out a which. There's several exemptions already carved out, so now it also says that um, college, um, that colleges and universities are also uh, exempt from that from that law, so they can uh, require vaccines if they want to. And the um, private institutions, I believe, have all required vaccines. Um, UNH, because of the federal contractor, is going along uh, voluntarily. They think it's a good idea, as far as I can tell. Uh, with uh, getting universal vaccine or, or testing. I've also, uh, also got one, I also have a bill in there which, uh, which says that employers cannot forbid employees from getting vaccinated. And I don't know of any cases where employers have tried to forbid employees from getting vaccinated, but I do know, um, I do know for example, there was a private school in Florida that got a lot of uh, that got a lot of attention for firing all its vaccinated faculty members and um, getting rid of its, facu uh, the, its vaccinated students because they believed incorrectly that um, getting vaccinated made you more dangerous than those around you, which is um, you know, exactly the opposite of the truth. And, and so, um, and then, and then, um, also want to mention something that I uh, worked on years ago, which is somewhat 
tangentially related, but it was the bill about uh, buffer zones around uh, reproductive health facilities. And I remember the time I, I was aware that there were some religious groups who objected to um, vaccinations, and I had heard from, you know, we'd had the anti-vaxxers who believe also incorrectly there's mercury and other dangerous things in the vaccines. Um, and I did, uh, I did ask the reproductive health clinics and also the other health if they ever had any trouble, problem with people picketing or interfering with other, um, with vaccinations. Also, some religious groups were also against blood transfusions. They said they'd never had any problems until the COVID vaccine, um, the COVID vaccine, uh, until COVID-19 came along, um, there wasn't, there wasn't this vast, uh, public outcry. There weren't large numbers of religious groups who opposed vaccinations. Um, so somehow, and I don't really know the answer to it. Somehow, I think a lot of people, I think somehow this has become, uh, at least a, a most, at least a, a position that's taken a lot, gotten a lot of attention. I'm not sure how many, how many people actually follow it because the vast majority of people I think are quietly um, taking the precautions they need to protect themselves against the pandemic, including being vaccinated. But back then, back then when we, when we passed that law, um, there was, you know, we, I did, we did ask whether there was any need for to put vac you know, vaccine clinics in there. And they said, no, 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 there's never been any problem. So there's a, now that there is a problem, you may want to consider uh, enacting a similar, um, a similar protection for vaccine clinics. I know they've had some problems um, in California with people, with protesters trying to block um, people from getting vaccines and, and tests. So, um, so anyway, so I guess I'll just close by saying that there is, a, I think the majority of people are in favor of the vaccines. They want as many of their neighbors to be vaccinated. Most people, most people are very afraid of COVID. They know how dangerous it is. And the, they also know that uh, the vaccines and the, other, uh, and the other precautions we've been taking are necessary and are effective. So I think, um, I think you should listen to the silent majority more than the more outspoken minority. Although I understand why they're, I mean, I understand why everybody's upset about this and scared, but I think you should listen to the silent um, anti-COVID and pro-vaccine majority on this. Thanks. Will, will you take questions? Oh, sure, why not? Sure, Let's any questions from the committee? I'm gonna ask one because, oh. Oh, uh, so I'll ask fine and then I'll yeah. represent Leon. So <clears throat> uh, whenever somebody uses the $750,000, thousand death toll that's in there, and I'm, I, I'm a kind of a numbers and data guy, and I guess my question was, are you aware that there are over 7,000 deaths reported in that total that are from self-inflicted injuries and poisoning but being classified as COVID deaths? Um, I, I have, not, have not heard that particular statistic. I, um, I don't really um, I mean some of, those, some of those people were probably severely depressed and suicidal even before COVID, and that was just one of the things that set them over the top, so I'm not... Um, even though nobody enjoyed being locked down, I nobody, I mean, I don't like wearing these masks. I don't think the number of people who've killed themselves because of that is, uh, I think that's a fraction of those who've been actually killed by the virus. So um, I'll, I'll look into that. I was not aware of that statistic. I don't know where it comes from, so I can't comment further than that. So. It's from the CDC website and their reported deaths and their causations of deaths okay. and that they classify as COVID deaths yeah. and then have a secondary classification and it's, Again, self-inflicted injury and poisonings. Um, and how many did you say it was again? Over 7,000. Okay, that's still just 1% of the 700,000. So I mean, I'll, I'll look into it, but um, I don't think, just not, I, that, you're not really. Uh, so a follow-up question. So sure. again, um, relative to vaccines, vaccine mandates, yeah. I, I think it was your testimony that this has never been an issue before. And I think that probably the crux of the factor is the mandate in and of itself, and that before um, citizens had the right to, through various exemption models, to get exemptions, and and now those models are being taken away. Those rights are being taken away to have exemptions. And we heard testimony from a nurse yesterday, uh, Monday, that said that while she was giving a religious exemption for the 
purpose of an influenza vaccine at her health care facility. When it came to COVID, they decided that she wasn't entitled to a religious exemption and took it away and fired her. So does that sound like a reasonable course of action that we want our businesses looking at how religious individuals are and whether they qualify or not for a religious exemption? Is that what we should be putting our businesses in the middle of? Well, the uh, businesses also have a vested interest in not killing off their employees, especially now there's a labor shortage or their customers. Um, this is a disease that's much more dangerous than the seasonal flu. And also, of course, the seasonal flu, I think, is more dangerous than we realize, too. There are actually a fair number of people get killed by it every year. But um, so in terms of that specific case, um, I was not at the I was not at the hearing yesterday. I also have no way of verifying if what she said was, was accurate or not. Uh, I, do, I can say, though, that, that when, we had, when we had a debate about religious procedures, the issue of vaccinations did not come up, and certainly the mainstream religious groups who were um, opposed to the buffer zone, and there are others who are in favor of it, but those who are opposed to it never brought up vaccinations at all, so they've never been, you know, they, those particular those particular groups, the Roman Catholic Church and mostly the evangelical movement, they're, they're, they were not opposed to vaccines then. There's certainly a Catholic Church, which I'm a member of, although not a very good member of, is actually actively pro-vaccine and also made a point when the pandemic started of, uh, you know, of uh, taking the emergency measures. They had, for example, the dramatic thing where the Pope addressed a did his Easter address in St. Peter's Square, and he pointedly had nobody in the square except for one cameraman. So certainly, uh, so certainly, my particular church that I was brought in is actually very much pro-vaccine. And there's I, so I'm not sure there was an answer in there, but okay. Okay. Well, I, um, I, again, uh, my question was strictly around: Is this what we want our businesses doing? Is determining whether somebody's religious enough? to be entitled to a religious exemption from a vaccine? That's my question. Should businesses be put in that position? And don't you agree that if we put them in that position, it creates then a follow-up civil rights problem for them if they should deny a medical exemption and say whole classes of people can no longer work in my facility because of their religious beliefs? Don't you think that because becomes a problem? Well, there's a constitutional right to freedom of religion. There is no constitutional right to uh spread a communicable dis disease so uh, I you know it's up to the businesses businesses to decide what their policy should be and I think probably most of them would like to have their most of them would like to have as many of their employees as possible be vaccinated um, and bearing in mind there probably are some legitimate cases where they where they can't but for whatever reason the number of people who are claiming religious exemptions seems to be vastly larger than it was back when the worst thing we had to worry about was say you know the seasonal flu and so forth. Representative Leon, do you have a question? You asked what I was going to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Horgan. Thank you. And I'm just speaking for myself with my opinions, and I, I understand where you're coming from, so thank you. Next up is Kelly Malloy. So I do want to speak in facts some specifics that are in the New Hampshire Constitution and the Constitution for the America, United States of America. But first, I'd, I'd like to actually take us all back a little bit. I'd like to take you back to being a teenager. And if you can remember what that was like. So for some of us, that's a long time ago. And maybe it's easier to remember or think about if you have a child that's currently a teenager. I think that our nation is very much like a teenager right now. There's a little bit of rebelliousness going on. There's a lot of what I think is best. I know best. I know better than those who came before me. I want to make up my own rules do things my way. And I think we all know where that goes, right? As we grow and mature, we realize that some of those rules and structures that were put in place by our parents were done so lovingly with wisdom, with experience of having been there before. 
and not out of cruelty or ignorance or not being cool. So teenagers often think that whatever, whatever is now, whatever is present is best, right? Their music, their clothing, their culture. And what I would say is that when we mature, we become adults ourselves, we often find that we go back to our parents' structure and standards and their beliefs, right, for our own children, because we realize there was validity there, assuming you had good moral standing parents. So in the case of this country, this nation, I look to our forefathers as our parents. And what I see is that they put a very specific structure in place, our Constitution, not just to limit government, which was definitely the intention, right, was to limit government. But I believe it was also to protect us, okay, to give us that compass, those guidelines, so that we didn't go completely off course from the intention of this nation, right? The intention of those founding documents was liberty. That was the aim, that was the goal, right? So with that in mind, I wanna point out a few things. One being what was just mentioned, the freedom of religion that is provided for in the New Hampshire Constitution as well as our federal constitution. But what is religion? So many of us think freedom of religion, what that pertains to is being able to go to wherever it is you want to worship, whether it's a mosque or a temple or a church, that freedom of religion to participate in your religious practices. But what is religion? It's a set of beliefs. Right? Some people might say it's ideology. So I, for instance, believe very strongly that there is one God, the creator of heaven and earth. I don't go to church, but I have a religious practice in my life, and I have beliefs that are associated with that. Other people believe there are many gods, other people believe that God is nature. And those beliefs will lead us to different practices. It might be specific foods that we eat or don't eat because it's part of our religious beliefs. It might be the way that we dress. It might be different customs. It might be the way we operate and function in our daily lives. But it's based on those beliefs. So we're allowed to have, and our beliefs, those religious freedoms to believe, are protected in these documents. They were provided for specifically. So if we look at Article 2 in the New Hampshire Constitution, in the Bill of Rights, all men have certain natural, essential, and inherent rights. Natural, inherent, that means from God. It's not given to us by government, right? It's from God. Rights among which are the enjoying and defending, and I know you all know this, but we can't hear this enough. Defending life and liberty, I'll skip through a little bit, seeking and obtaining happiness. So if we actually start to define these words and what they mean, what is life, what is liberty, what is the ability to obtain happiness, the pursuit of happiness. And tie that in with the religious freedoms and the protection of our religious freedoms. Article, the next article 2B, right of privacy, an individual's right to live free from governmental intrusion in private or personal information is again natural, essential, and inherent. Some of these rights, in Article 4, it states, are in their very nature unalienable. They cannot be taken away. This is the limit on government that our founding fathers put in place 
to keep us on course, to not be in continual debate about our beliefs, because we're going to have different beliefs. Every individual has a natural, this is Article 5, a natural and unalienable right to worship God according to the dictates of his own conscience and reason, and no subject shall be hurt, molested, or restrained in his person, liberty, liberty or estate for worshiping God in the manner and season most agreeable to the dictates of his own conscience. So if it is in with my own conscience, that I do not want to partake in a medical intervention. That is a belief. That is an unalienable belief that cannot be taken from me. And no government can mandate that I go against my conscience. It says it right here. I think the rest of these you all know. So I'm going to jump to some US code. So this is Title 18, Section 241, Conspiracy Against Rights. If two or more persons conspire to injure, oppress, threaten, or intimidate any person in any state, territory, commonwealth, possession, or district in the free exercise or enjoyment of any right or privilege secured to him by the Constitution or the laws of the United States, or because of his having so exercised the same, or if two or more persons go in disguise on the highway or on the premises of another with intent to prevent or hinder his free exercise or enjoyment of any right or privilege so secured, they shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than 10 years, or both. And if death results from the acts committed It can be sent, there can be a sentence of death. So there's an oath that's taken, right, to protect and uphold the Constitution. And that oath is taken before God. So just like there are consequences for teenage children who go off course or misbehave or don't follow the rules of structure. There are consequences for those who take an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States or New Hampshire and who break that oath. Title 18, Section 245, whoever, whether or not acting under color of law, by force or threat of force, willfully injures, intimidates, or interferes with, or attempts to injure, intimidate, or interfere with any person because he or he is or has been, or in order to intimidate such person or any other person or any class of persons from, there's a whole lot of them, but I'm gonna focus on C, which is applying for or enjoying employment or any prerequisite thereof by any agency of the United States In section two, any person because of his race, color, religion, or national origin applying for or enjoying employment or any prerequisite thereof by any private employer or any agency of any state or subdivision thereof or joining or using the services or advantage of any labor organization, hiring hall, or employment agency. And then there's lots more here. But when we get to the shall and shall nots, so any person, whoever, whoever, whether or not acting under the color of the law or not, shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than one year or both. And if bodily injury results from the acts committed in violation of this section, may be sentenced to death. So, I'm really just here to request that you take your oath seriously in upholding the New Hampshire Constitution and the Constitution for the United States of America, that we have freedoms, 
that have been granted to us that cannot be taken away. They are unalienable. And those freedoms include our beliefs, our freedom of religion. And our founders put those in place to help all of us, to help all of us stay on the course of freedom and liberty. That was our main goal as a nation, to get away from tyranny. So those safeguards were put in place for that reason. So if we think we know better, if we think we can make up new rules and new standards and create a new structure, let us not be so arrogant. Let us not be that teenager, that rebellious teenager, and let us learn from the past. Let us learn from the wisdom and experience of those founding fathers and follow suit. Thank you. Thank you. Are you willing to take questions? Sure. Does the committee have any questions for Ms. Malloy? Seeing none, thank you very much. <clears throat> Next up is Louise Spencer of Concord. Thank you for taking my comments today. Um, my name is Louise Spencer. I'm from Concord, New Hampshire. And I was here at the Monday hearing. I was asked um, to provide some information to- Louise, can you just step up to the- You're gonna need to talk a little louder with your mask on or take it off while you speak one of the two. Um, I was asked to provide some information uh, to specifically Representative Leon. So I wrote a letter in follow-up to that request, and I would like to read that for the record um, today. So uh, I write in follow-up to your request at today's public hearing that I forward high-quality medical studies that would show I was correct in stating that there was misinformation being presented at today's hearing and elsewhere, and in support of my position that elected officials must do a better job on countering such misinformation. I am happy to provide you with additional materials. However, given that there was so much in-person testimony with so much misinformation included, I respectfully request that you let me know what specific points you would like me to address. Would it be the claim that COVID vaccines, that those, um, that the COVID vaccine is a shot of AIDS? that those receiving the COVID vaccine are pricked with cancer-causing substances, that COVID is not dangerous, that COVID does not kill anyone, that the vaccine does not protect against variants, that, the COVID is not, that COVID is not a pandemic. There was other misinformation presented, but these seem some of the more prima facie false claims. I apologize, I had to leave early at the last hearing, so I might have missed others. It would have been helpful if you had asked some of the people who spoke against vaccines the same question you asked me, and I would be interested in seeing what high quality medical data they have to support the claims listed above that are clearly false. I appreciate that the COVID-19 virus is a novel virus and that the vaccine developed in response, the vaccines developed in response are new although they are indeed based on years of research. I also recognize that there are many issues upon which there is not yet broad consensus within the medical and scientific communities, the role of natural immunity being one such instance. Where I think some of our elected leaders do a disservice is when they support or refuse to confront the sort of obvious disinformation that sadly was too often on display this failure undermines our ability to have real conversations and policy discussions that can help lead to compromise and best practices that benefit all of us. I again implore your committee to adopt an affirmative statement, recognizing the critically important role that vaccines have had and continue to have in advancing and maintaining good public health and promoting the adoption of science-based immunization policies and procedures. 
So that was my letter. I also sent along a follow-up that talked about the Salk and Sabin vaccines and the fact that both are still, variants of both are still in use today, with some having um, value depending on the situation in which they are used. I would also just like to add that upon hearing the last testimony, throughout the course of our nation, rights have always been balanced with responsibilities and that we have a court system that helps us to navigate that difficult process. Rights often come into conflict with one another and there is no absolute right guaranteed to anyone in the Constitution. If there were, then the death penalty in every instance would be considered unconstitutional. But clearly, the right to life is not an absolute right. So at some point, we need to recognize that difficult decisions have to be made. We had a founding father, George Washington, who required his troops to get vaccinated. Did that violate, violate, violate other rights? It certainly did. But a balance had to be struck and a decision had to be made. So with that, I will conclude my testimony for today. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Spencer? Um, Erica, uh, yes. Representative Land. Thank you. Um, and if I may respond some, because that was a letter that was sent to me. Um, thank you for that information on the SOC and Sabin. I actually have had the privilege of reading the typewritten letter um, from Jonas Salk when he was accepting award at the, uh, the White House, because he worked with Sabin to bring forth the vaccines that actually were the ones that did impact the world. So thank you for bringing light to that collaborative, decades-long process in order to perfect the vaccines. Um, when you speak to rights and responsibilities, mm -hmm. uh, is there a different standard of rights when you are offering a choice to somebody or mandating them to take, um, to take a procedure? You know, I wish that we had the same sort of civic engagement and sense of personal responsibility that would allow us to really do a rigorous and robust public education campaign that would help people to make, to understand that the vaccines are generally safe and that people would voluntarily take these vaccines. I really wish that was the case. Unfortunately, that is greatly hampered by the sort of misinformation that is not being confronted that makes it difficult for people to decide to voluntarily take that vaccine. And so if we were taking away the misinformation and just dealing with the facts, yes, I can understand that there are some people for religious or other purposes that might decide not to take the vaccine. But if 80 or 90% of the population were through good education efforts with correct information, vaccinated, that would be much less of a problem. We've seen that already with vaccine programs about measles, rubella, where the government puts out a campaign with the help of public health officials and the public responds in a generally positive way. We've seen when people in certain communities have withdrawn their support of vaccines. We've seen measles, for example, We've seen many outbreaks, small, localized, um, I'm not sure you would call it an epidemic in that instance because it's local, but with a broad outbreak. So, um, you know, I think we can get all riled up about the mandates, but I think there's so much we could do before, mandate, before we even need to talk about mandates. And I wish that our public leaders would stand up and start confronting this information and help people get the real facts about this vaccine. And my last follow-up is, do you know the difference between an observational study, um, especially a retrospective observational study and a prospective randomized controlled trial and the difference in clinical evidence for them? 
You know, that's not my responsibility here to know that. You have a state epidemiologist, you have a Department of Health, you can get that information there. I'm speaking as a public citizen, as a citizen here with my concerns. I think there's a role for lay information. We can call a spade a spade. You cannot look at the claim that the vaccine injects AIDS and say that that is based on any scientific data. And that should be confronted, and we should look to our leaders to confront that information. So I don't need to be caught up in requests for medical data. You have plenty of resources at your disposal for that. So thank you. Thank you. And the CDC guidelines are based upon observational studies. Um, and also, know. the other information is not trying to force a choice. So thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Spencer, uh, one, more, one more question. Sorry. So I'm my sure you can hear my frustration, because I will admit I am highly frustrated by what I saw on Monday and what I'm seeing here and what I see go on beyond these rooms. So I am frustrated. So, so I, I guess my question is, is, is to your point of <clears throat> conversation, intelligent conversation, and I'm going to say non-emotional conversation, mm -hmm. right? Because that's the hardest part we have is, right, is, mm -hmm. is when we talk, trying to have these conversations, for lack of a better phrase, in the abstract and not in the, in the, in the emotional phase. So I, I guess my question is, you know, when you're trying to have these conversations, do you agree it's important to have the right data? Yes. Right. So I, I think that one of the things we, we talk about, but we talk about vaccination rates, right? And we know that in New Hampshire, at least our New Hampshire dashboard's wrong. We know that. The commissioners come out and said that. So they're reporting roughly about 800,000 800, uh, citizens of, of the 1.3 million in our state have been vaccinated. The CDC reports over a million. Right, so we're approaching 80%, well beyond that, um, the, of, of vaccinated of people with vaccinations. I'm in, not, let me finish. In New Hampshire? In New Hampshire. So we're over a million citizens have, have had a, well, at least one shot or are vaccin vaccinated according to the same metric that the state's using on their website, which is 800,000. So I guess my question is, I, I guess my point is, is that you agree we have to have honest conversations, right? And we talk about data. When you're approaching over a million people in New Hampshire being vaccinated and then forcing upon the remaining 300,000 um, a vaccine they've chosen not to get for whatever reason. I don't know what those reasons are. I can't come up with 300,000 reasons why people may choose not to get the vaccine. But my, I guess my point is, don't you think we're just arguing over the, for the sake of arguing at this point? No, not at all. And I, again, I'm not here primarily to talk about the mandates, um, because I think, again, there's a lot that we could do shy of mandates. I think in instances, mandates are necessary. What I'm really here to do is to encourage your committee to make a very strong and robust statement that vaccines are a critical part of our state health policy, public health policy, that they have historically and currently been critically important to the health and well-being of our communities and that um, we need to base our policies on good science and data. So I agree that data is important. I also agree that there are places that we don't have clear data and I would love to have those sorts of conversations. But when those conversations get obscured by things that are clearly, clearly not true, then we can't really, then that's when the emotion starts going and we can't then really sit down and make compromises. I have a niece whose political views I do not share and who is, um, she homeschools her children, she is very um, careful about what she, how she chooses, you know, their diet, um, she, is very conservative about additives um, and various other things that go into their body. Her children are vaccinated, but she has chosen not to vaccinate her children with COVID. However, she also wears a mask and has her children wear masks when they go out to, in public. 
She observes social distancing. She's respectful when someone else expresses concern about the fact that she's not vaccinated and makes a request of them, a simple request. And I really respect her. And I respect her opinion about that. And I understand that she has a different view than I do about it. I also understand that there are religious exemptions. You know, our Constitution has a conscientious objector clause in it. Uh, that is not always, that's not universally granted. So, you know, if you want to claim as a Quaker, you know, I'm familiar with people seeking religious exemptions for things like conscientious objection. But that's not, you have to go and you do actually have to present your religious beliefs. They don't have to be part of a church. They don't have to be something that someone else determines. But you are required to show that it's a sincerely held belief. So it's not, you know, unprecedented for people to have to actually um, say, you know, what, where their religious it, um, concerns come from. So I just think that when we, you know, that there's a lot of room here for us actually to have conversation. What happens is we get into our camps where we can't come together and actually talk about the things that are undecided, that we don't have good data on, that people have questions about. I would love us to find that space and I think one of the ways to find that space is when we discard the clearly um, incorrect information and we begin with things that we can start to verify and that we can start to um, you know, put the science behind. And I have no problem standing here and saying that I believe firmly in science. And science is an uncertain thing. It doesn't pur purport to know everything, in fact, the opposite. Science is about inquiry. And we need to be doing more inquiry here. And then, but we do at some point need to look at the data that we get and make some decisions based on that. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is Alexandra Men Menella. Okay, good morning. I'm Alexandra Manella. And I'm not going to state any scientific studies or uh, statistics because I don't think those things matter in this case. Um, I don't need those things to know that my civil rights are being violated. Um, and I don't need those things. Um, none of those things matter. They don't justify mandates in this case. So I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to talk about statistics or science. That's not what matters right now. I'm going to briefly comment on HB 220. I think it's a good start, um, but there's a couple of things I would change. So it states in paragraph one, every person has the natural, essential, and inherent right to bodily integrity, free from any threat or compulsion by government to accept an immunization and I would add here a medical procedure, right? Because I, I added this in because I'm not really sure how far this hysteria can go. It starts with immunizations and vaccines, um, but who knows where this will lead us. I continue. Accordingly, no person may be compelled to receive, uh, accordingly, no person may be compelled to receive an immunization. It originally said for COVID-19, but I would cross that out and again, add a medical procedure in order to secure, receive, or access any public facility, any public benefit, or any public service from the state of New Hampshire, or any political subdivision thereof, including but not limited to counties, cities, towns, precincts, water districts, school districts, school administrative units, or quasi-public entities. And the last sentence I would add here, this shall apply to all private entities seeking to do business or that are currently doing business in the state of New Hampshire. Now, I am not up here advocating for more laws, right? I'm not happy that we need 32 bills to try to protect our inherent rights. That's insane to me. I'm not ad advocating for more government intervention or for socialism, as our, government, as our governor would call it. But right now, we're in the middle 
of a massive assault on our civil rights under the guise of public health and safety. Your constituents are being threatened by their employers for not injecting pharmaceuticals into their bodies. They're being forced to submit themselves to regular medical testing and absurd mask-wearing rituals. They're being harassed by their HR departments to disclose their religious beliefs. Right, none of this is acceptable. And sadly, we're starting to get accustomed to this as a society. So I ask you, do you really think that coercing people into taking drugs and treating human beings like they're farm animals advances humanity in any meaningful way? This is barbaric. Treating healthy people as if they're sick and forcing them to consume drugs is barbaric. And it's our duty and your duty to put an end to this and to put an end to the stranglehold that Big Pharma has in this country. The science is nowhere near settled on vaccines and it never ever will be. We shouldn't have to beg for exemptions for our jobs. We shouldn't have to be justifying our religious beliefs to our employers. Right? We don't want exemptions. We just want the mandates dropped. So again, I don't want any more laws on the books, but we're sort of running out of options here to resolve this thing. And right now we're looking to our elected leaders to defend our civil rights like we pay them our taxes to do. But over the past two years, oh, they failed us in many ways. And again, I say we're running out of options to live peaceable and quiet lives here. This is not the last pandemic that we're gonna go through, but I want you all to know that there is no emergency in this world, even if half of the planet was dropping dead from a pandemic, that justifies the suspension of our natural, inherent rights and our individual liberties. It is not the role of our elected officials to enslave us for our own good. We do not pay you to do this. And I'll end it here. God is watching what we do here. I pray for you all to turn to him for your guidance on these matters and your decision making. And thank you for the time. Thank you, Alexandra. Appreciate your testimony. Does anybody have a question for Alexandria? Seeing none, thank you very much. Next up is Diane Lachance. Good morning. Can you hear me with the mask on? Uh, yeah, if we have a problem, I'll let you know. But okay. just make sure you're up close and you're speaking loud. Okay, I would prefer to wear the mask. I am, uh, my name is Diane LaChance. I'm from Kentucky, New Hampshire. Um, I prefer to wear the mask because I'm not vaccinated. And I, I have to say, I feel I'm being denied the vaccine because I'm being denied important information about my medical health in order to make the appropriate decision for myself. And um, I, I come here a little bit unprepared because I've been spending countless hours watching the FDA hearings from start to finish and your meeting and realized that my opportunity to speak was uh, coming to a close and I better come down and just speak from my heart and hope that um, my emotions don't overtake me. But um, uh, I agree uh, with the people who speak about wanting data. I think it's very important and misinformation um, today makes us all spend countless hours looking for the truth. Um, I find it very hard to talk to people about what's going on with the FDA and the CDC and the formulation of this vaccine because people don't even feel like they are smart enough to watch those hearings. And I will tell you that most of the scientists who speak, I don't know what they're talking about, but I have to say they're very intelligent people and they make very intelligent conclusions that the layperson can understand. I have a brother who's a nuclear engineer. If I ask him a question about the nuclear industry, he knows how to talk to people who don't understand it. Um, so I would encourage people to watch those hearings because if you do, I think you might come up to the same conclusion that I am is that um, there's still a lot of data that we don't have. Um, they claim that working at the speed of science. I worked for a pharmaceutical research and manufacturing company for 18 years. I know very well the speed of science. It is not fast. This is going much too fast. Um, 
if people who are concerned about us getting the right data um, want to champion something, um, how about let's talk about the VAERS reports. Let's have a really honest discussion about what that data means. Um, I'm feeling a little, um, I don't know what the right word is. Um, still trying to sort out what I heard at the FDA approval meeting for the five to 11 year olds and that was, a, I believe, and again, I don't, I've been spending a lot of time and I only have so much time and I, I will say I wish you'd have one more public meeting next week and I would promise to come with a prepared script and much more thorough um, testimony um, because in the little bit of time I had to look into the vSafe app that was rolled out with the 5 to 11 approval. From what I can see, parents can enroll their children, let them know they had that vaccine or any vaccine that they have ever had, and they will get notifications when vaccines are due. And parents can also log in that they've had an adverse reaction, their child. And there's already been some talk that parents are going to believe that they have reported an adverse event. This app, and it clearly states it on the website, um, is not theirs. You have to also go to theirs. Um, the speed at which we all operate and use apps and whatever, I think is another danger because I don't think parents understand that if their child has a severe reaction, I'm sure the first thing they're gonna do is go to that app because the first thing they want is medical attention for their child. But how many are gonna assume that that data is being looked at for the study? How long will it take for us to get that data to understand what is happening with the five to 11 year olds? if it's not going into VAERS or there's a misunderstanding. Again, we're gonna have some more backlog data. I see it as a double accounting system, which doesn't belong anywhere. Um, and I think this committee, I would implore you to look at that. The V-SAFE program is so new that Wikipedia doesn't even have an article about it yet. <laughs> so I, we're gonna all be going on Facebook and hearing this information like people have warned against and real information, but we're not gonna know what it is. So the new information I, I bring to you is um, the vSafe um, app and how that is um, going to help our heart this conversation and the ability for us all to make the right decision for ourselves. Um, I just wanna check real quick some notes I made. I don't believe that the majority opinion is what our uh, constitution intended to be the dictate of, of what we do. Um, and with that, I'm just gonna say, you know, if, if that's how some people think, St. Anselm's Public Policy did a recent poll and it, and it says that most people, although they agree with the vaccine, don't agree with the mandate. Um, I'm just throwing that out to the people who believe that majority opinion is what should determine our decisions. Um, I'm gonna stop there because I am not real prepared and I don't wanna just ramble on. Um, I'm just gonna again repeat, please check the V-SAFE, everyone, take a look at it. I'd like to hear what people have to say about it. I believe it's a double data um, collection. I think we're not gonna get information as quickly as we need important information. So I thank you very much. Sorry, thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much. I do want to cor correct something I said. I said earlier that there were roughly 7,000 uh, reported COVID deaths that were related to, and I quote, intentional or unintentional injury or poisonings, and that number is really 15,100, not 7,000. All right, next up is Allison Dyer. Hi, I'm Allison Dyer, I'm from Nashua, New Hampshire. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak today. I understand that this committee is reviewing a vast array of bills related to immunizations. 
I am cautiously hopeful that your reasons for wanting our input in these sessions is because you do, in fact, plan to utilize it, as we are asking, in your roles as elected officials. I'm one of your New Hampshire residents that has been begging and pleading for you to stand up for the live free or die state. I've lived here in New Hampshire all my life. I work here, I was married here, I gave birth to my daughter here, and I love my life here because I love what New Hampshire had to offer and what New Hampshire has afforded to myself and my family. I'm also the daughter of a nurse, a nurse whose career has spanned 47 years who cannot be here today to speak, but faces the same fate as I and so many here today. My mother, a nurse of 47 years, a woman who has dedicated her life to caring for others, will lose her job in five days due to the vaccine mandate. A nurse who contracted COVID while working through the pandemic, but never missed a beat. Now, despite her antibodies still showing nine months later, will have her career ended in a way that couldn't be more degrading, given her 47 years of devoted service and faithful service to the care of others. Her provider would not sign off on her medical exemption, despite the adverse and very scary vaccination and immunization history that she has. She has submitted a religious exemption based on her sincerely held beliefs, but to date we have no response, and based on what so many others in the healthcare field have been communicating, these exemptions are all being denied. So our employers and this administration has been given license to be judge, jury, and executioner of our faith, as well as our bodies. I myself have worked in the healthcare field for 15 years. I lost my job at Dartmouth-Hitchcock on October the 8th. I was there for 14 years and eight as a remote-only employee doing prior authorizations. I, like my mother, had COVID too. I have antibodies a full 10 months later. My medical exemption was denied. Despite my documented history of severe allergic reactions, despite a letter from my primary care stating I should not get this vaccine, despite my antibody test, and despite my plea of abject fear that as a mother of a young child, with my history of very visceral and horrific reactions to immunizations that I was afraid to die. Dartmouth Hitchcock sent me my denial for the COVID vaccine, my approval for the flu vaccine exemption, as I have had for 10 years, and my termination paperwork. 14 years gone. And the kicker is, three days after I was terminated for not complying with the vaccination because my natural immunity meant nothing, despite what history has always told us about prior infections and antibodies, the Red Cross called me to ask me if I would donate more blood because I'm a universal donor with COVID antibodies. My natural immunity was good enough to donate blood to help persons recover from COVID, but not good enough to keep my job. I face the same at my current employer. Our date is 1115. I will lose my health insurance and the ability to care for my daughter. I have again applied for exemptions, but to date have received no response despite my efforts to follow up. If it goes anything like it did at Dartmouth, I will essentially be homeless on Monday along with my mother. Dr. Strang pointed earlier in this week to informed consent cannot be defined in this situation. This is not patient-centered. These mandates and the inaction of our elected officials to clarify what they mean for New Hampshire has led to chaos. Employers are so fearful to not be able to report a business-wide 99% vaccination rate that they're willing to terminate healthcare workers who for their entire careers, pandemic aside, have been unwavering in their care of all of us. When have we had press announcements of business flu vaccination rates? I tried to look. I couldn't find any major announcements about the compliance of flu from any institutions. Back in 2010, when they began man mandating the flu vaccine in the healthcare setting, the vaccine had been out and FDA approved since 2007, and the nasal flu since 2003. So for the vaccine, three whole years of data people had to review before making the decision to be vaccinated. It's November 10th, 2021. The COVID vaccine 
under emergency use has been available to the general public for less than one full year still. And still, the FDA approved one only came in August, so less than three months. Why was it okay for the flu vaccine to allow people to take the time to review the data and decide, but now we're being forced to choose between taking care of our families, our careers, for less than a year's worth of real-time data? Why does New Hampshire's own laws allow for natural immunity as an exemption to vaccination, but not for this one? Is it because we used to use history and historical data prior to COVID? And while the COVID-19 is a newer virus, it would seem that everything that came before in history, from mass studies to natural immunity, was just thrown out the proverbial window. And despite the FDA advisory committee stating, quote, we're never going to learn about how safe this vaccine is unless we start giving it. One of our very own New Hampshire representatives put in an LSR to require the COVID vaccine in order to attend public school. Public school. Free, fair, and appropriate education, but only if you vaccinate your child and hope it's safe? The NIH is quietly studying the effects of this vaccine on women's menstrual cycles. On August 30th, on the NIH website, listed in their items of interest section, they had been given a grant for $1.67 million to study the correlation of the COVID vaccine to changes in women's menstrual cycles, heavier than usual bleeding, and other changes. But you want me as a mother and a woman to give this to my seven-year-old daughter in a society to attend school, knowing I could potentially be altering her ovaries or causing permanent damaging hormonal changes to her body at seven years old? for a virus that she has a 99.9% .9 chance of recovery from. Also, shouldn't this study the NIH is doing be enough for women in the workforce to be medically exempt from the vaccine at this time? At least until the study is completed and vetted? But no, I, along with my mother, will lose my full-time job in five days. If some of this legislation comes to pass this next session, families will also be forced to make a decision to vaccinate their children or leave the public school system. For anyone thinking of that, by the way, check out education freedom accounts. Thank you, Glenn Cordelli and Commissioner Edelblue. Lastly, anyone who has critical thinking brain or individual thought could see the writing on the wall for all of this when they said two weeks to slow the spread, that we would be on the fast track to losing liberty, to life, and live as we choose. So here we are almost two years later. So with this committee and the 32 bills looking to come through this house during this session, I am here today to ask that you return what is rightfully ours as citizens of America and to restore New Hampshire to the live free or die state that we all knew once and loved. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Allison. Is there any questions for Allison? Not seeing any. Thank you, Allison. Stephen Robinson. Just step up to the mic and speak nice and loud. Better? Okay. There you go. You. Uh, I heard that you had some issues with emails I sent on Monday, uh, so I want to read my email I sent, as long as uh, well as a um, something I wrote this morning as well. You can hear me, right? Can you, hear me? you can go ahead, go ahead and read your email. All right. Good morning, my constituents. We, the people of the Live Free and Die State of New Hampshire. I wanted to be heard that I am all against mandates that pertain to immunizations that is before us today and being talked about at this meeting. The choice is a personal one for each of us and the freedom of choice, freedom to choose what goes in our bodies. This has to stop. We have a constitution in place and the law of the land and for every human being in it must be upheld. You all took an oath when elected to fulfill your oath. With a 99.8% recovery rate against this virus flu, our own immune system is the best defense against this man-made virus. Viruses have been around since the dawn of time and will always be. This train of destruction has to stop against the American people and the thievery, the thievery that comes with it in the form of grants and big farmer. It must be shut down once and for good for the sake of mankind 
I personally have experienced three direct deaths due to this vaccine. Most recently, my uncle two weeks ago, okay, of heart failure. Okay, two neighbors two months ago of heart failure after getting fully vaccinated. Everybody in this room has been exposed to COVID at some level. Your own natural immune system, immune system is going to help you fight this, not a man-made genocide jab, personally. Um, as I was driving in this morning on 93, I saw a, uh, a road sign that says 99 deaths, too many. How many are on the VAERS report? Way too many. All right, that being said, put a stop to the mandates. This goes to my notes I wrote this morning. As an informed, concerned, educated citizen of the United of the New Hampshire, the live free of die state, and a proud citizen of the United States of America, and as a husband, father, and friend, and the most important title I carry is to a little innocent child that calls me Papa, my granddaughter. Okay, that's why I'm here, fighting for her rights and the rights of these children. That these mandates are going against these kids five to five to eleven. That's ridiculous. It's totally absurd. Um, as you all heard testimony on Monday with clear and concise facts from doctors, lawyers, EMTs, mothers, fathers, and parents-to-be, along with grandparents and people who love their freedom and want what was granted to them in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, page 4, articles, articles 1, 2, and 2b. I can read them if you want, but already no sense repeating ourselves. That being, with, that being said, I, as I walked in this morning, I was here at 7.30, quarter of 8, I uh, happened to notice that the Marines were celebrating their birthday, 246 years. I'm going to read something I wrote about that. Uh, as we celebrate the birthday of the United States of a Marine, the Society of American Marine Corps, established in 1775, 246 years, 46 years of bravery and honor to defend the Constitution, Sorry, I lost my place for a second. And the citizens of the USA, those brave men and women who gave some and gave all for freedom and the American way of life. With that being said, it makes me very angry, along with many others, that we are here today discussing infringes on our freedoms at many levels. I'm fortunate to stand here today taking time off work as others cannot. There are many more, I guarantee, 100% that would love to be here and fill this chamber beyond capacity. This whole co co uh, co coercion, collusion between big pharma and government and the cabal and the elite has to stop not today, not yesterday, not last month. It should never happen. You are all breaking the laws of the land. Okay. As we all see here every day, the effects of the so-called vaccine is called the genocide mRNA jab and, and it makes you non-human anymore along with the 5G. Who knows what that's going to do to people? Okay? You recall killing, and killing innocent people for the wealth and power and control. Dr. Fauci has been caught in so many lies, it's beyond me why he's still in the position he is in. It's crimes against humanity. Remember the Nuremberg trials. History will repeat itself. Okay? I'd like to end on that note. Any newscast or webpage that labels me as an anti-vaxxer or other defaming name, you will have legal action taken against you. I want to be known... Not as a anti-vaccine, but as a pure blood. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Uh, any any questions from the committee? Seeing none. Thank you very much. <laughs> Derek Arnold. Good morning, board committee, and good morning, we the people. I lived my 50 years, my kids have not yet, my grandbabies have not yet. They deserve the opportunity we all have had. We know that any structure needs, has an architect, it needs to be built on solid ground. We call New Hampshire the Granite State. Our Constitution of 1776, the architects, our forefathers, 
the most bold line on that is we the people. We the people pay all of your salaries. Anybody that takes an oath to protect all humanity, there's a monument out front here that states it. I expect the hearts of the people that are making these decisions to do the right things from your heart. I didn't come here with a planned speech. I am not a public speaker. I travel state to state seeking truth, speaking truth. I've been to the border wall. I've been to the White House. I travel from Florida to the Texas, from Florida to Maine. My both my grandfathers were war heroes. George Arnold was US Navy. He was he swam back on the USS Independence, saving lives. He was on the USS Hornet, saving lives. He was dead when I was a year old by Big Pharma, wrong heart medication. So when are we gonna bring the facts, transparency, and truth? Because fake news does not do that. So I am in a position where I need to be frontline, boots on the ground, seeking the truth for we the people for my kids and my grandbabies. Plain and simple. And all these people here, and everybody that might watch this, and everybody in every country, every county, every state, every town. We have our free will and our free choice. That was given to us in 1776. However, the act of 1871, started to take that from us. And if you look on the back of your dollar bill at the pyramid with the all-seeing eye that stares us in the face all our life, the fake fiat currency that has no gold back, has no backing whatsoever, okay, all this money that big farmers is putting in their pockets, all our selected officials, not fairly elected officials, taking the seats to serve we the people, are taking bribes. No more fooling we the people. We the people are taking our solid foundation. We are the architects of what we put in our bodies. I don't believe in putting experimental drugs in my body and I don't believe that anybody should be forced on that. I want to read the definition of a vaccine. And then I'm going to break down one specific word in this. So Derek, you're, you're, I'll give you an extra uh, couple minutes, but we're approaching 10 minutes now. And so if we could we'll kind of tighten it up okay. a little bit. So let's do this. Let's go to the mass first. Let's cover that first. Because masks are proven they do not stop viruses. The package in the hospital with the blue mask states on the back, they're for emergency only, they do not stop viruses. If you were to find one type of mask that is 100% proof stopping a virus, then each and every one of us would have to wear that particular mask. We don't go make our own mask with fabric and say that is stopping a virus. That is stopping your voice. We experienced over there with a mask on your voice that your voice can't be heard clearly. So that's the mask situation. Now this experimental drug that has truly not been FDA approved only emergency only, so let's put the facts out. Let's be transparent about things. 
because that's what the world needs. That's what we the people need. We need transparency throughout. Not when you choose to be transparent. I don't plan speeches, I don't write them, I speak from my heart. So how are we forcing an experimental drug that's biological, which is stated in the definition of a vaccine. Let's break that word down. Bio, logical, bio, logical. Well, our 1776, we had common law. The act of 1871 put us into maritime law. Well, how about we go into common sense law with logic, awareness, and wisdom. Do your due diligence, do your research, because I do hours and hours and hours of it. I travel many, many states on my time in my dime. I don't get paid to do what I do. I don't have children in schools, but I go to the school board meetings. Why? Because all life matters. All humanity matters. The tree of life, the birds, all created life. Not man, you, factured, or man, ipulated, or man, dates. How about we keep our God-given rights? And I'm going to stop there because I guess my 10 minutes is up, and I appreciate the time you have given me, and I appreciate all these people that stand aside me and that go out in these streets and to the hospitals and school boards that stand aside me for the same reason, to save all humanity. Thank you, Derek. Appreciate your thank testimony. You. Any questions for Derek? Seeing none, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Next up is Josie, and I apologize, Josie, I'm not going to try to butcher your last name. Hi, uh, good morning. My name's Josie Kumandala, for the record. Uh, I'm a resident of Bedford, New Hampshire, and uh, I'm just going to reel it back in. I'm going to keep it really short. Um, so I just want to express my concern about the wording of the amendment to HB 220. The language currently states that no person may be compelled to receive an immunization for COVID-19 in order to secure, receive, or access any public facility. My question is, what about a vaccine for COVID-20, COVID-21? The media is constantly reminding us and warning us about variants and uh, they all, this will surely lead to more boosters and new vaccines. And uh, I'm also concerned that, you know, based on uh, the warnings of the experts, uh, that on a long enough timeline, nobody is going to be fully vaccinated because the CDC and the WHO reserve the right to update their definition of fully vaccinated. So it's, it's my wish to express my concern that we need to take a hard line now against any and all coerced medical procedures, uh, COVID-19, flu, anything we just we need to uphold the right of bodily autonomy my body my choice that needs to be inscribed as the law of the land uh, and that's got to be uh, fundamental um, this human right also um, in regards to this bill I don't think this bill goes far enough um, in protecting the most vulnerable of society ie the children the elderly the incarcerated the mentally ill Human beings uh, are sacred. They have inalienable rights endowed by their creator. Uh, as for me personally, I have no king but Jesus. Um, and I think that this bill is a good start, but in many ways does not go far enough in upholding our fundamental inalienable human rights. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Questions? So Josie, I'll just give you a couple uh, comments. Um, I was the author of HB 220 and Senator Bradley uh, was amended some of that bill um, and there are several bills that are currently pending um, including when to repeal it altogether um, and so just know there there are we are looking at that bill in the upcoming session to see how it can be uh, modified excellent thank you
Kate Smith. Thanks for letting me speak. If you could just speak, step up so we can hear you better. My name is Catherine Smith. I'm a 56 year old resident of Chichester. I've lived in New Hampshire since 2000. During this time, I've worked in healthcare. I earned my associate's degree at NHTI and then my BSN at SNHU. I stand here before you as an educated medical person who has been vaccinated over 30 times. I am also a parent who has an 18-year-old son and he's been vaccinated every time they require it up until this year. So please, when I speak before you today, do not think for one minute to label me as an anti-vaxxer, misinformed, or a conspiracy theorist, because I have none of those attributes. 30 years ago, the idea of global tyranny under the premise of a global economic system was revealed to me by an author named Gary Carr. He wrote a book entitled In Route to Global Occupation. And in an attempt to, it was his attempt to warn the world about this plan that was in process. And since that time, I've witnessed this plan unfold. Hence, when the President of the United States declared the country was going to be locked down along with the rest of the world, Due to a novel virus, I felt mentally and spiritually prepared for what was unfolding. As we stand here today and we deliberate the policy of medical interventions, I politely ask you to please just stop all the rhetoric. We need to start calling out this pandemic for what it is, a terrorist attack on a global population. Using a bioweapon created with tax funded money by our scientists who we hire to protect us. This attack has been followed by an incessant propaganda campaign of fear-mongering and psychological warfare to move this people towards vaccination status. And that's where we stand here today, to vaccinate or not to vaccinate. This is also an attempt to move the United States population from exercising their constitutional freedoms as lawmakers continually abuse their position to create new restrictions on our rights and liberties. Selling us the idea that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few is intended not for our safety or out of concern for our health and well-being, but it is a move to our, it is rather to move our society into corporate fascism, which in turn permits our politicians to move forward with their Build Back Better campaign which is right out of the United Nations language. We know what you're doing. We know all the funding that follows. Build back better. We, it's the Green New Deal. And they're using all the COVID relief funding to put in this infrastructure. The real issue any of us should be talking about is the ensuing COVID passport which is the capstone of this virus, lockdown, mask wearing, social distancing, contact tracing, asymptomatic spread, nasal swab, and vaccine baloney. Op this operation has been distracting the American people for 22 months. We know the COVID passport is about a digital identity created on the blockchain system. It exists in China. They're pushing it in Israel, they're pushing it in other states, countries around the world. They're implementing it in New York. They're pushing it in Orange County. It has many names, the Wellness Passport, Health Passport, Excelsior app, an application you're telling us to put in. Well, I'm here to tell you that the men and women of New Hampshire have played this pandemic game politely for far too long. Every patriot I've met over the last 22 months would rather stand and resist this technocratic tyranny than succumb under the guise of fear and safety. And most would rather die than succumb to this type of total surveillance and loss of self-autonomy. Now is the time for you to stop fooling yourselves and insulting your constituents with this continual barrage against our rights as free men and women living on the land of this wonderful continent. We know our freedoms and our liberties, and they're endowed by our Creator. We know who we fight, and we know what we fight for. So I have to turn the focus not on vaccines, but on your role at this time in history. It's time for the elected body to come together and to make your stand with your fellow countrymen and women. It is this moment in history that you will never get back. 
It is time for you, as representatives of the people of New Hampshire, to stand with the people for freedom, to resist this tyranny, and to be a beacon of light, a glimmer of hope for the rest of the country. For when one stands and we, another stands, and then another, and then we can all stand together, united as people, to say no, our children is, are not for sale. For we are not divided. We stand united, and we will fight. We know our rights, and we understand our common law. We are coming for our sheriffs, our policymakers, our elected officials, our teachers, and anyone else who stands with the globalists and attempts to take away our freedom. We will hold you accountable. And when this war is won, we will hold you accountable. Because we will win this war. We will not succumb. And it is your job to know the pulse of your people. And I have been out there for 10, 11, 12 months talking to people on the streets. And people know what's happening. They're not stupid. We don't want to play this vaccine game because we know the end game is a vaccine passport. And we know where that's taking us. And we know what is coming. And we will not take it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. I just want to take a moment. Apparently, we have a fourth grade class that's come to visit us up in the gallery. So I want to thank you guys for coming. And I hope you enjoy your tour of the State House. Which school we got up there today? I'm sorry, can someone repeat what they said? I can't hear. Rye Elementary School. Well, thank you guys for coming. I hope you enjoy the uh, State House and enjoy your, your day today. All right, next up we have uh, Catherine Mendola, I believe it is. Let's set that aside. Next we'll have uh, Virginis Fernand. Fernand, I can't say the name. V-I-R-G-I-N-I-C-E, it looks like. Nope. Okay, I'll hold off on that one. Next up we have... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, ma'am. I didn't see you. Stand up. Just say your name for the record so I can... Virginia. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead, ma'am. So I am completely out of my comfort zone here. I just need to say that. I am a grandmother, and I've lived in New Hampshire since 1970. I have um, eight grandchildren, one great-grandchildren, child... <laughs> and I'm here on their behalf. Most of the people that have spoken this morning, I completely agree with. I believe that we are on a path right now that at this moment in time, we have the opportunity, maybe the last one, to reverse the direction that seems to be overwhelming us right now. I have a grandson who is a very gifted and talented physical therapist who has had to choose to either get, this is this morning printed from the VARS, we asked for documentation, site. He had to choose between taking all of these risks into his body and into his life or lose his ability to uh, support his family. I believe he's wisely chosen to not do this to himself. He's out of work. As things stand right now, he will not be able to return to what he's gifted and talented for, which was the care of our senior population in their home. I have another friend here in New Hampshire who works from home for a company that is requiring everyone to be universally vaccinated with all of these ramifications or lose his job in two weeks. None of this makes sense. None of this serves the purpose. I am an old lady. I need medical facilities that I can go to when my body breaks down. 
I sleep at night because I have people out there who protect me and have always protected me and my family, the fire, the police, communities that have taken care of each other in the face of whatever has come our way. If this is not stopped now, we, the people, will not be protected. We will not have life-sustaining services that we rely on. Our children will be damaged by this. Give them the vaccine, and then we'll see what happens. What does that mean? What does that mean? That all of our children can be just random test subjects? I beg you for the benefit of my family to stand at this pivotal time in history because you may never be given this chance to do it again if you don't do it now for us. Please. Obey your oath of office. I was there October 13th and I saw what it looks like when people do not follow their oath of office, they're ordered to not follow their oath of office. Please don't be a part of that. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. Any questions for Virginia? <laughs> Seeing none, thank you. So I a card I can't read, but the gentleman's from Hillsboro. I don't know what his first Labelle, Labe, Labrie, Lembrie. Is that? Yeah, that's Corey. Corey, maybe? Labrie? Could you say your name so I can get it? I can write. Corey Lavoy from Hillsborough, Deering County, Rats. Um, thank you for to the assembled and the committee for giving me this time to speak. Um, by now, you've heard all the data that's held in contention by contemporary media and in, uh, attempts to enforce consensus on this topic. At, I could go into, well, by not saying it, I'm going to go into a little bit. Mass mandates are an interesting point here because that was kind of the opening. Could of the you speak into the mic? I'm, we're having a hard time. There you go. It's almost like the opening of a foot in the door with the mass mandates was this idea that completely false, that they don't that they protect you. How do they don't protect you? There's data that's gone out explaining how they collect contaminants in the membrane of the mask, thereby contributing to oral infection and lung infections. Now, going from that, we have the whole thing kicked in the door in the face saying the alternative to mass is vaccination. Well, let's go to what the core issue of that is, is human sovereignty and saying that your body as it stands is inadequate without some form of medical intervention. That is a policy that we've had in this nation since birth, subjected young males in the form of infant male genital mutilation, known as circumcision, sorry to say. Now, we see that then being a, a kind of underground kind of gestalt in our society. Well, that again is saying that the body as it stands is not adequate as it is created and produced. We are or biological organisms. We shed skin cells. We have hair drop out. We have, you know, boogers and snot and all that kind of stuff. We're, we're a little grimy. There's a fear of that written in the human paradigm that has a sensical aspect, but again, some, some nonsense too. And when you get the nonsense side of it, you get something that becomes servile and very vindictive because it's afraid of itself, it's afraid of human nature. It does not want people to be walking around breathing freely because it's scared of what that other person not, might not just breathe out, but what might come through the person's energy and their breath when they speak. If we go to his, want to go to a historical context on this, I actually find myself going back to the back, looking into the Black Plague that hit Europe. This was said to be a respiratory tract infection in both cases, but in the case of the after effects of the vaccine and a strange phenomenon that was called the St. Vistus dance during that time period, people were having definite neurological conditions and symptoms and reactions to what was said to be COVID. If you look at the symptoms of COVID, they overlap 
with CO2 poisoning, with oxygen deprivation, and neurological conditions that would be brought, eventually be brought about by this vaccine. It is a daunting endeavor to be able to look at this unbiased and understand how deeply this was planned out. But it's something that we have to face. And I come back again to the term servile. To be servile, that vindictiveness, it's that fear, but also a kind of perverse need to bring everyone down to your level, to say that this person you know, threatens me by their being more aware or being more empowered in themselves, and therefore I want to take them down a peg because I don't feel that in myself. That, I believe, is the core aspect of this that we are facing as a nation and something that's coming out as we are inevitably obligated to consider these factors and how your fear does not ultimately enable you, or should not enable you, to dictate to other people how they live their lives, how they express themselves, how they have free enterprise. What you see as being wrong about them without concretely examining or deciding if it really is correct or not for the body politic. These are all factors that were being made to face yet again in a kind of very much a, a boiling over almost of these factors that have been simmering in our cultural gestalts in our existence as, a tr as humanity. And now comes the time when we have to decide the path we're going to follow to promote which is really helpful, which really helps and sustains human life versus that servile aspect that will comply with tyranny and say basically, you know, as long as you're as long as I have my standing, I don't care how far it makes other people fall. I don't care if other people get pulled down by it. Because, I, because of being told again and again that people are inadequate, that we're flawed, that that means that everyone else has to be, you know, in a, in a state of duress, of being, you know, of feeling comfortable with that. It's, to so try and explain for well, I can't, I can't explain much further than that, really, with what I'm trying to articulate by those points. And I'm sure if the committee and those here speaking on behalf of sovereignty are, you know, seeing that too, but, you know, everyone, everyone who can speak on it and bring some clarity to it counts. So. Thank you, Corey. Is there any questions for Corey? Corey, was it? Yes. Corey, for any questions for Corey? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony today, sir. Very much appreciate it. Thank you. Catherine Mendola. I think I asked for her before. Nope. We have three more speakers. Oh, or, unless we find Catherine. And we have four. Uh, Paula John, I think it is. So just to give everyone an update while she's coming up to the microphone, I, the goal is we have three speakers left, counting Paula. Um, we'll take a, a brief recess and we'll reconvene in a different room um, and the committee will start doing some of its work on what the report will look like. Yeah. Excuse me one second. Sure. Okay. Great. All right. Go ahead, Paula. I apologize. Okay, good morning, uh, members of the committee, and thank you for allowing me to come here again today to speak. Monday was in better shape than I am today because I am a person with a disability. Although I don't look like I have a disability, I do. And I'll tell you something, I'm getting sick and tired of being discriminated against out there and even at my board meetings because I am elected too. This thing with the mask has gone way too far, way too far, because if you have a disability and you can't breathe with it, it doesn't matter, you're discriminated against. And on Monday I said I will be losing my job tomorrow because I cannot wear a mask, because I cannot breathe with it. And it is really a shame what's going on in this state. I didn't come prepared to write anything because I came in very quickly because my body does not allow me to walk or move fast at, at times. And so today I'm standing here in excruciating pain and the thought of being vaccinated I think would kill me because of my autoimmune, because of fibromyalgia. Oh, that's right, people don't know that much about fibromyalgia. This is a very debilitating disease. 
It affects the nerves and the muscles. And I don't talk about it very much because I try to go on with my life as normal for 29 years from a severe auto accident that I had. And I got up this morning, it's the first time that I've gotten up and felt beaten up by the board I sat on last night, going after me again because I cannot wear a mask, trying to help people with a disability to make accessible access for them. And you know, and I look at, around here, and these children that, I, that were up here that came in with masks, masks. So I did some a little bit of work here. Thank God for these phones, I guess. I hate it because they track you every place you go. Um, you know, and I'm looking at some things here. CDC, okay. Who owns the CDC? Big Pharma owns the CDC. So that's why they tell us what to do, that we have to take the vaccines. Make no mistakes, they do. Um, I'm going through some. CDC gets millions of dollars annually from Big Pharma. Of course. That's why they all want us to have the vaccines. Oh, and FDA, who do they get their funding from now? FDA's funding has increasingly come from industries that it regulates. My mother used to say, if FDA approves it, don't take it, they're gonna kill you. She was absolutely right, even with this emergency youth authorization. And I said on Monday, I sat in a, this chamber here, my seat was 5-17, and I didn't realize that. That was my mother's birthday, and she passed away in March after I got sworn in. But she gave me the courage to sit here, and I didn't vote party lines. I voted what I thought was best for the state and my constituents in Nashua because the people elected me, like they have done in Nashua again, to do the best that I have to do to protect them and the kids. But why? I, mean, I came flying up here again this morning late because I couldn't move this morning, and a friend of mine called me, and I was crying on the phone. Nobody ever sees me crying because I have to be strong for my constituents. I'm tired of getting beaten up. Everybody who's sitting here is tired of getting beaten up that we should have to come here and beg our elected officials to do what they have to do is right. Then we took, I talked about in the spring of last year, the masks that the parents in Florida that sent out to get tested. And you know what came back in those masks? Legionnaire's disease from the bacteria. Streptococcus, wait a second, that's, that's worse than the, vac than the vaccine in certain extents. Well, let me back up. That's worse than COVID because children don't get COVID, and if they do, it's very minimal. Their survival rate is better than anybody else, but then again, you know, let's talk about Cuomo, put elderly patients who were sick in a nursing home and killed them. That was the, the whole thing, to kill off the elderly. So then we have, what else do we have in here? Oh, I hit my page. And I'm not gonna be shut down in speaking from what I'm going to say. You get pneumonia, tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is worse than COVID. Meningitis is worse than COVID. And the list goes on and on and on. Parasites, fungi, dangerous pathogens. Cloth, the paper masks are coming back with, they're having carcinogen in it. Masks. Preliminary analysis found toxic chemicals in these paper masks and some masks. These include known allergens and carcinogens as well as controlled substance. Masks intend to be used by the general public are not deemed to be PPE. Therefore, they do not have to meet the standards by masks worn by doctors. 80%, 85% of all masks made worldwide come from China. China, that's where the COVID came from, China. And concerns have been raised over substandard and manufacturing supply chains. So we're putting these on our face. And even the kids have said toxic because I brought it to my meeting. So what I want to say here, I guess maybe in closing, I'm going to read a list here. And I'm not going to be stopped. Um, are these, as long as it's not getting into personal attacks, please it's go just, ahead. You know what, it's not. It's just a list. Uh, it's not a personal attack. This is public. It's just a list of all our state senators who took money from um, Pfizer. And I think it has to be known that we're... Th this is about policy and not and about I'm people. Not, you know what? I, I'm allowed to, 
you can't stop the public from doing this because I think people need to know because of the fact that we have to come here, this is my second time here, begging, begging for people, for our rights in this state. And one of the senators is sitting right there, and I won't mention the name, $6,400 from Pfizer. So how does a senator sit on a committee, and how does anybody sit on these committees, sit and vote on policy for us that we're fighting not to take the jab, not to have the masks on these kids, when they take money from these big farmers? Am I correct, everybody here? We the people. We the people. So it is public record. So I'm going to start. Sharon Carson, $7,650. Jeff Bradley, $6,400. Chuck Moore, $6,400. And $7,200 of America. Please, um, this, is, this is in the public record. If people want to look it up, they can look to the campaign finance system. Oh, well, this is this public is, record. It is. Okay. But we're not going for public attack, uh, going for well, personal. I'm I'm just making Sorry, we're not going for the personal. It's not personal. But I'll tell you, thank you very much, because now the people are starting to see here who's taking the money and why we, the people, have to come here and fight for our rights. And these are our forefathers who gave us our God-living rights and given us our rights to be here. No citizen in this state should have to fight. Live free or die. And if you want to take the money, don't run for election. We don't want any of you anymore. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> Rosemary, Rosemary Landry. For me. Um, my name is Rosemary Landry and I am from Merrith, New Hampshire. I am a mother, a grandmother, and a registered nurse. I am retired at the present, but I nursed in medical surgical nursing and pediatric nursing was my heart and soul. So I am here to talk um, about different, different avenues of the um, so-called um, gene therapy, which is its real name. It's not a vaccine. They just put a vaccine name on it to hide it. So um, um, we've never seen this level of side effects for any vaccine, gene therapy injection, without the FDA taking action. The rotavirus vaccine was canceled was canceled for 15 cases of non-lethal side effects. And the swine flu vaccine was canceled for 25 deaths. But now, by the CDC's own data, we are seeing a 1,200, 12,000% increase in deaths with these vaccines. And they are promoting this to our kids. Children's ACE receptors are not prominent. Therefore, they are not getting COVID as much. Pediatrician Dr. Larry Pulowski states, ACE receptors in children do not connect well. Now, um, with your permission, I forgot to say good morning to everybody, and thank you for listening. Um, my, I'm going, I want to read the adverse reactions, the list. They are numerous, there's 23 of them. Um, number one is Guillain-Barre syndrome. Two is um, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, transverse myelitis. A lot of the side effects have to do with the spinal cord. Um, encephalitis, myelitis, encephalomyelitis, meningitis, encephalitis, and meningitis. Convulsion, seizures, stroke, deaths. Um, let's see here. Where am I? Okay. Um, all right. Stroke, narcolepsy, cataplexy, anaphylaxis, acute MI, myocarditis, infarction, um, pericarditis, acute immune disease, and death. Pregnancy and birth outcome syndrome in children. 
Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that, take that out. Other acute um, myelitis diseases, non-reactions um, oh, non, um, non such as, as anaphylactic shock, um, thrombocytopenia, which is bleeding, disseminated, um, coagulation, which is a clot, venous thromboembolus, which is clot, you can also get um, arthritis and um, joint pain, and Kawasaki's disease in children, and multiple inflammatory syndrome in children. This affects children a lot. Um, as a reference to all these side effects, in Meredith, we have, I know three people who've had a bad reaction from the visa. One is a friend of mine who got a microclot in his eye in a small vessel and is now blind. Um, the other two um, had um, chicken pox virus. And I'm sure there's much more in Merith that have been affected, but I don't know of them, but I'm probably sure. Um, I just read that the CDD, CDC is putting in a blood thinner in five to six year old kids so that they can get vaccinated. And what do they think will be, be the side effect? Bleeding. If it's not clotting, it's bleeding from these um, gene therapy. I don't like to call it a vaccine because it really isn't a vaccine. Why would the CDC give young children a blood thinner? Why in heaven's name would they do this to our children? This is a red flag for all parents and teenagers who have already had the shot and had these problems, such as pericarditis and all heart diseases. You know, they, what's happening? I don't understand it. Why are they doing this to our children? Um, the dose has been decreased for children. Why wasn't it for the, the, the it decreased for the teens? Why not? And for the young? Why wasn't it, um, Oh, I forgot to say pericarditis. And well now, all these children, and I read that um, a five and a six year old in Indiana was mistakenly given the adult vaccine dose instead of the flu shot. Both those children are cardiac compromised now. And they're only three and five. Um, so what's gonna happen with these kids and these teens? You know what is going to happen to them? They're going to be, they're going to be um, a cardiac invalid, uh, invalid for the rest of their lives. These crimes are against humanity. I really don't understand that at all. Why the CDC can even give us and tell us what to do. They're not the government. Um, I'm, I want to read something else, what they're doing. The National Institute of Health approved a $3 million grant to the University of Pittsburgh for inducing labor on full-term pregnant women, and then removed organs from the fetuses for the school's tissue bank. The truth is always more bizarre than fiction. This, and according to the medical records obtained, the University of Pittsburgh medical search team Will, would take full-term pregnant women and induce them only to then take their baby organs for sale. Studies show that the university would take unborn babies from six weeks to 42 weeks, remove their organs, and then proceed to place the organs in the school's tissue bank where they would put them in the vaccines or whatever they want to do, it's, it's disgraceful. These universities are disgraceful. I have a couple of other things, but I think they've been mentioned already. Um, um, menticide means the killing of the mind. Priming society begins with fear using waves of terror, which is propaganda, which promotes confusion and helps to break down the mind. The big lie is emotional. Use, they use contradictory reports to confuse, which descends into total terror, 
total terror, no, I'm having trouble with that word, total terror, totalitarian. So um, I thank you for your time, and um, hopefully you will put, I know you've got a lot of laws already, you know, ready to set and discuss, but I hope in my heart and soul and that you will take the right step and um, do more with the um, bill about the vaccine in the first place because it is very, it's not all pertinent to what's happening. So I thank you very much. Thank okay. you, Rosemary. Any questions thank for Rosemary? For, thank you for all you do. I actually, Rosemary, she, sorry. Rosemary, I do would you be willing to uh, take a question? Yes. Um, uh, Representative Land, go ahead. Um, thank you Hi, for, you? I'm good. Thank you for bringing attention to the recent FDA approval of Pradaxa, which is a novel anticoagulant for children. Um, are you aware that that's actually for kids that have mechanical heart valves and other things that otherwise are on warfarin? Um, I, know uh, it's, I know it seems well, sinister, yeah. but there's a good medical use. No, I think there are children that are on it who are compromised. Because I, I worked in pediatrics in Boston in my training. And, um, but they are going to give it, be giving it to healthy kids. That's the problem. I don't see any of that in the approval, but thank you. Oh, I do have that. Um, I can send you stuff. Thank, thank you. you. All right, so a couple more speakers. Again, if we can keep the testimony to under 10 minutes, preferably around five, that would be really appreciated. Um, Patricia Myers. Is Patricia here? Go ahead, ma'am. I spoke Monday. So again, lift that microphone up so it's pointing straight at your mouth. There you go. Sorry, I was here Monday. I wasn't particularly articulate, but uh, a couple of things I want to get out of the way first. Um, I don't, I take exception to be referred to as anti-vax. I am not anti-vax. I've had more vaccinations than most of you in this room, unless you were in the military. Um, I am pro-health, and to coin a phrase, pro-life. Um, as far as the controversy against vaccinations, do you remember the anthrax vaccine that came out in the 80s and 90s? My husband was in the military and he had that. And he had complications in the military. You do not tell them, I am not taking a vaccine. They will discharge you dishonorably. And the other issue as far as information on these things, there is a website, frontlinedoctors.com. They have a very comprehensive um, informational site. The other one is um, you can look up Geert van der Bosch. He is one of the developers of the vaccine. And he is one of the people who are telling us not to take it. He knows what's in it. He made it. Okay. The crux of my uh, testimony this morning is that this is not the issue. COVID, anything associated with it is not the issue. You have several bills pending about COVID. Why do we need so many bills? In my opinion, there are way too many bills on the books. They should be burned. They're expensive to bring forward, and they very rarely end up what they were intended to do. You heard testimony about the, um, the language saying only COVID is protect uh, people you should change the language to all medical procedures, not just COVID. That's one of the things that happens with our laws. I know I read them, and I'm very good with grammar. My premise is that we should go back to the original laws, the Constitution of this state. The biblical laws, which are even higher, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and might. Then you won't be as inclined perhaps to cave. The next one, love your neighbor as yourself. And I understand some of us may not love ourselves very well, so that might hinder how we love others. But to make it clearer, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Do no harm to your neighbor. 
I am Christian, obviously. That's supposed to be a warm, fuzzy thing, but even Christ made a whip and chased out those who defiled his father's house. And make no mistake, these houses are God's. Anyway, the legislature of this state is supposed to protect the interests of the people that it serves. And I will say right now that there are members here who do that. Admirably so, and I respect them for that. Our state is not obliged to bow down to the federal government. That is why we make laws to stop the encroachment of that government. The issue is the corruption, the broken system. That's what the issue is. The issue is taking money and then voting on issues that affect the people who gave this, the money. The issue is um, an executive chief who puts his police force to an open shame by having people arrested for nothing more than that they were too enthusiastic in their recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance. Right now, the way I see it, this state has been in the process of being sold to the highest bidder. It is time for that to stop. It is your job to enforce the checks and balances that the founders put in place to ensure that these assaults go no further on our freedoms. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia. So apparently we have another group of, I'm assuming students, that's come into the State House from uh, Virginia. Where, where we have people from today? Welcome to the State House, guys. Welcome to the House of Representatives. You're in front of the committee that's examining the policy of medical interventions and immunizations. It was a study committee that came out of House Bill 220, which was a bill that um, restricted government from uh, creating certain side of COVID passports and that, uh, those kind of things. Um, and this study committee came out of that. We're hearing public testimony today um, on the topic of uh, medical interventions and immunizations and how it relates to state and federal policy. So thank you again for coming. We appreciate you. I hope you guys enjoy the tour. Um, so we have two more speakers. We have Jay Is 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 Islin um, to speak. Is Jay here? So Jay, you spoke on Monday, so I'm going to ask you to limit your... your um, your speech, yeah, I think I gave you 10 minutes on Monday. I'll give you another five minutes today to, to speak. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, my name is Jay Islin. I am presently residing in Lindenville, Vermont, but uh, I'm really from New Hampshire. I grew up in New Hampshire. I have New Hampshire values. I don't like what I'm seeing all around this nation. I have this nation's values. I uh, have lived most of my life working in human services. I am also, uh, my other true self is, uh, I am an artist and I am a writer. Okay, well, I've written a piece for today. I have a quote here, Dr. Peter McCulloch author of the first and only peer-reviewed COVID-19 disease treatment protocol. The only one. Very much unlike Dr. Fauci's, I might add. He says, due to viral loads, the vaccines do not provide any safety in terms of protect your loved ones. Okay, my aim here is to cut through some of the dead wood in the discussion. Although hundreds of thousands of Americans 
are this fall lining up before committees and school boards and exposing the COVID pandemic fraud and corruption a thousand times over, the committees sit there in their seats and shuffle papers around, then go home to their complacent non-FBI violated homes. Virtually nothing is being done by U.S. state or local committees in response to the grievances about the COVID fraud. I hope that I'm understating that. So sorry if I am, you know. I, I hope you folks are different. <clears throat> All this mirrors what's going on in other countries. Those countries were never really free, but the U.S. is acting just like them now. There's no difference now except a bit of severity which we uh, are still spared temporarily. Millions and millions of concerned citizens of other nations are rising up around the world and calling out the tyranny, demanding that it end. But there is zero responsiveness to the, the, the people's movement around the world, only crushing force in return by their governments. The police, with expressions of boredom, complacency, and cold power on their faces, carry out the abominable deeds and support them. Just the same as in America. In New Hampshire, you have whistleblower Therese Grinnell being arrested and charged with the crime of saying amen to the phrase under God in the Pledge of Allegiance, or the crime of endeavoring to keep illegal meetings with illegal votes from happening. Can this kind of travesty of justice be tolerated? Not on my watch. The attitude by officials, employers, anyone holding a position of relative power seems to be, it's not our job to actually do something substantial about this. It's not our department. It's as if all of us were born in early 20th century Berlin or in Bavaria. In reality, it is one's responsibility and it is one's department when fraud and crime are being committed to act strongly or to do <clears throat> what the very least one can to call it out and to refrain from cooperating with it no matter what position one is in. Fraud and crime. The President of the United States commits the crime of, com crime of completely abandoning separation of powers by acting as a dictator, handing down COVID decrees while calling them rules. How many people fully call this what it is, the end of the U.S.? Yes, legal objection are raised by the administration. <coughs> uh, <coughs> legal objections are raised, but the administration is confident they will amount to nothing. This is the end of the U.S. unless we, the people, and you, the members of this committee, take strong action. Fraud and deception. The media speaks in a single mouthpiece voice with the government declaring absurdly that a vaccine that should have been banned a hundred times over by now is safe and effective. We have no media. It is in the hands of mobsters. The mainstream media accuses its victims of misinforming everyone, which is in fact its own hard and fast rule. Airline pilots take the vac vaccination and then when they get up to altitude in their plane, they get tunnel vision and they barely get the plane down to the ground and can't remember how they did it. The same thing happens to truck drivers. One could go on and on, but the real point is, it's a weapon. But the media tells us, this is not happening. Jay, down to 30 seconds. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower warned, warned us of the military industrial complex. How pertinent his warning becomes today. Robert Kennedy Jr. has delved into the, some of the history of the CIA, how it was initially established as an espionage organization tasked solely with intelligence gathering, only to transform into a paramilitary agency engaged with the overthrowing of democracies around the world and other nefarious and anti-democratic activities. This transformation is globalist, imperialist in nature. CIA's pro Project Mockingbird seems to have never ended. Mockingbird, appropriately named, is of course a program in which the media is infiltrated by covert agencies. February 10th, 2021, Instagram banned the account of acclaimed health researcher Robert F. Kennedy Jr. for sharing debunked claims about the coronavirus or vaccines. As Edward Curtin put it in an Off Guardian article, 
For all practical purposes, when it comes to matters that bear on important foreign and domestic matters, the CIA and the corporate mainstream media cannot be distinguished. Dr. Joseph Mercola states, in the past year, even licen licensed medical doctors and award-winning scientists have undergone the modern version of being tarred and feathered online, followed by expulsion from their web-based communities for the crime of asking common sense questions and speaking truth to power. Jay. This is, this is not to mention being attacked by members of their own medical societies who wish to go along to get along. Uh, Jay, so it sounds like you're reading your testimony and you have a written copy, which we're happy to take for the committee, but we're out of time for, for again, this is your second, yep, second yep, speech. Well, well sir, I, uh, I beg your consideration because, um, you know, another thing that's happening and has been happening for quite a number of years in these committee hearings is that the time people are given in which to express what they have to say is not adequate and, uh, and indeed uh, often the people who want to speak don't even get to speak. Fortunately, that's not the case here. So I, I beg your indulgence a little further. How, how much more time do you think you need? Uh, just, just about five more minutes. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Kurt, Edward Curtin continues, just the other day the New York Times had this headline, Robert Kennedy Jr. barred from Instagram over false virus claims. Notice the lack of the word alleged before false virus claims in the New York Times. This is guilt by headline. It is a perfect piece of propaganda posing as reporting since it accuses Kennedy, a brilliant and honorable man, of falsity and stupidity, thus justifying in Instagram's ban. And it, it is an inducement to further censorship of Mr. Kennedy by Facebook, Instagram's parent company. This is one example of the censorship underway with much, much more to follow. What was once done on the cover of omission, omission is now done openly and brazenly, cheered on by those who, in an act of bad faith, claim to be upholders of the First Amendment and the importance of, of free debate in a democracy. We are quickly slipping into an unreal totalitarian social order. End of curtain quote. Fraud and crime, the definition of terrorism is simply to terrorize the public for political ends. Such terrorizing is precisely what has been going on, especially over the past two years, at, at the hands of the globalist controlled entity that once was the legitimate United States. Our beloved nation's political center has become an actual terrorist extremist government <coughs> accusing its own citizens of its very own crimes. In this Saul Alinsky style technique, anyone that disagrees with the government is unbelievable, now labeled a domestic terrorist. I, I a citizen, am here to tell you that such Orwellian action in the U.S. simply cannot be abided or tolerated for an instant. You members of this very committee cannot let this continue to happen. You cannot. Fraud via corrupt interests. In December 2020, Dr. Pierre Corey was invited to testify to Congress. He did so proving to Congress that ivermectin zinc vitamin D treatment entirely eradicates the risky or deadly features of COVID-19 disease, including its very transmission from person to person. Corey's written testimony containing evidence from over 25 studies was ignored and even scorned by members of Congress because the plan to enact vaccines has been set in stone from a very long way back and billions of dollars were and st are still involved. Fraud and corruption. CDC and FDA pretends that the approved Comirnaty vaccine is the same as the now brand name vaccine being dispensed. That's for liability reasons. Fraud and crime. It has been discovered that some batches of the COVID vaccines are extremely poisonous, while other batches are much less so. In legitimate medicine, that situation would cause an immediate halt to the vaccine program. Has the program been halted? No, it is pushed harder than ever. Fraud and medical malfeasance. As of mid-November 2021, around 19,000 victims 
have died as a result of the U.S. administered COVID-19 vaccines. That's according to the hugely underreported CDC VAERS data. Even a few years ago, if such a disaster had occurred, the entire program would have been halted instantly and permanently. Medical fraud and malfeasance in study of pregnant women, the NIH is reputed to have monetary interests via patents in the vaccines. The pregnancy study by the NIH completed June 2021 was called Preliminary Findings of MRNA COVID-19 Vaccine Safety in Pregnant Persons. The result of it was that more than eight out of 10 women in the study who could have a miscarriage had one. The authors of the study did everything in their power to commit fraud by hiding this result. The shocking result was hidden fraudulently within the very time frames in the study for technically early births resulting in death are only called miscarriages if they are before the 20th week. But the study hid its own results by doing the figuring as if all the women had started the study close to the beginning of their pregnancy, whereas actually on only a small percentage of them had done that. In this way, the deeply disturbing miscarriages in this, <coughs> in this uh, small subgroup were falsely given the statistical number of individual setting of the entire group rather than naturally using the number of individuals in the small early term group in the study, the only group which was even capable of technically having any miscarriage. Abnormal early delivery in later pregnancy terms goes by other names than miscarriage. <clears throat> Faced with enemies, if we have stood if we stood on the New Jersey or North Carolina shore around 1943 watching an oil tanker ship go by on the horizon, the ship might suddenly have exploded, sending a huge cloud of giant fragments of ship into the air. Would we in the newspapers weirdly and twistedly say about this event, oh, some patriotic domestic terrorist must have endangered us all <clears throat> by lighting a cigarette on that tanker, causing it to blow up? Or instead, would we, would we in legit newspapers have realized, using common sense, oh, another German submarine has struck our nation with a torpedo. Of course, it was a torpedo by Germans. They wished us harm. This is exactly the situation we find ourselves in today. We are being attacked, yes, but not by our loyal American fellow citizens to get us to suspect or frame them as we are encouraged and even ordered to do is like the strange idea of suspecting a terrorist cigarette smoker on the 1943 oil tanker. So the ludicrous planted idea pushed by Mockingbird Media today that we the people are the enemy is a ruse. The interests that are attacking us are non-American and they are super elite interests. And I just want to close by saying and reminding everyone present and thank you for others who have invoked our Divine Father. I, <clears throat> I want to remind everyone that our constitutions, the state and the national constitution, are firmly based on the principles of the Ten Commandments, including the principles of thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods, thy neighbor's house, possessions, and so forth. We see a society coming in that is the opposite of that. I saw a, a hearing of San Diego, California uh, school board, I believe it was, and the people came up before the committee. They were given almost no time to speak. They were very, very wealthy people. They were very, very impressive. And they bring up all kinds of, of really strong points. But I see very little mention of the Lord who created us. And without this recognition, we are really cooked. Because I, I am certain that the Lord who created us is not happy with, with what's going on, and especially with the lack of repentance on the part of all of us in the American public, of our once Christian-based nation, even the principal 
of separation of church and powers is directly from Jesus Christ. My kingdom is not of this world. <clears throat> so with, with that, I thank you so much, and I'm so glad that I'm not in the Vermont house right now where there is very, very little chance of being genuinely and sincerely heard. And I thank you so much in the state of New Hampshire, and I, th I thank the Lord Jesus Christ. In, the <clears throat> in his name, amen. Thank you, Jay. <clears throat> hey, Jay, I know you were, Jay, Jay, I know you were reading from your uh, testimony. If you could submit that, um, that would be really helpful for the committee members to be able to see if you could submit that either by email or if you want to give what you have written there to Representative Leon, she can add that to make sure it's clearly in the record for anybody to read in the future. Kathleen? Okay, so I'll move on. Um, Elliot Axelman. Oh, you ready, Kathleen? Oops, sorry, Elliot. Why do you hold on one second? Go ahead, Kathleen. Go ahead, ma'am. Good morning. I want to start by thanking God and my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we're all able to be here this morning exercising our rights, our right of freedom of speech, and our rights that are God-given, unalienable, they cannot be taken away, they cannot be sold, they cannot be traded, they cannot be lost, they cannot be given away, they cannot. And I see pretty much everything that's happening around the government intrusion into our health, especially around this COVID treatment and so forth is, is a complete violation of our rights, violation of our Fourth Amendment right to begin with. And I see the world around us, and I, I, think there's, I don't think there's anybody that would dispute this. I see the world around me and us turning very hellish. Why is that? The Bible tells us that the wicked and the nations that forget God are turned into hell. And I say that's exactly what's happening. And we, as Jay said, we have a chance now. We have a chance. Thank you, God. We have a chance to repent, which means to turn from our wicked ways and turn toward God. And that's for everybody. I'm not really just speaking to you folks. It's, it's to, to me. It's to all of us. And so there are some very, very brave people physicians and highly credentialed, credible physicians all around the world, too many to, to mention. I'm just going to mention a few of them. Jay mentioned Pierre Corey and his testimony before <coughs> Congress that ivermectin is the, is, there's been 61 studies done worldwide at this point that prove, peer-reviewed studies, that prove that ivermectin is almost 100% effective in treating COVID especially when given as effective early outpatient treatment. Did you know that 99% of the deaths from COVID occur where? Anybody know? In hospitals, why? Could it be because they're given remdesivir, which is a, is a disastrous drug that does in the kidneys and floods the lungs with fluid, and then they're put on a, in a ventilator um, I'll tell you what Zeb Zelenko has to say about this, Dr. Zeb Zelenko, in an interview. By the way, I've sent you videos and documentation of everything that I'm saying. Dr. Zeb Zelenko, who has been effectively treating COVID uh, since the get-go, effectively treating it, in an interview, I think it was a couple days ago, basically said that what's going on with COVID and the treatment of it right now is premeditated first-degree murder and genocide of at least 750,000 Americans. I think he's being kind there because it's worldwide. Um, so that's to be paid attention to. I mean, we, what, what is this? Are, are we living in Nazi Germany right now? I don't, I don't think so. I think this is Nazi Germany on steroids. In the 1930s, people 
kind of would, they would turn their head the other way. They were afraid to speak up. They didn't speak up while their grandmothers and their children were carted off to Auschwitz to be gassed to death. What are we doing now? What is the general public doing now? They've been very, in a very sophisticated manner. It seems that they've been mind controlled and brainwashed. I mean, it has to be something like that. Plus the forgetting of God and the love of truth. It has to be something like that because people won't talk about it. Our nation has been very deliberately divided. This, the whole thing that's going on, this COVID thing, is one big piece of a much larger puzzle of the intentional, deliberate, long-term takedown and coup of the United States of America. The greatest nation on the, on the earth. Why? Because we are and we were the last bastion of freedom. For the rest of the world, are we just gonna sit here and do nothing? And, and let <clears throat> the whole world go you know where, are we? No, not, as Jay said, not on my watch, not on our watch. We love this nation, we love what God gave us. Thank you, God. The very values and principles upon which this nation is founded are reflections of the very values of God himself. And we are duty bound to stand up for those, to stand up for truth and what is right and good. So, in Sweden, they didn't mask, they didn't social distance, what's the other thing that everybody's doing? They, they did none of that. And they have 1.8 million children and zero deaths from COVID. Isn't that interesting? But of course, we won't hear about that on mainstream media. I suggest that anybody who's still watching mainstream media or listening to the hypnotic uh, droning voices of NPR, National Propaganda Radio, that you shut those things off. If you're still buying into the lies, you please, uh, please God, help everybody that is buying into lies. Open their eyes, Lord, remove the scales from our eyes. Open our hearts, Lord, help us to, to see what's really going on and to stand up against it. Dr. Michael Yaden, the former vice president of, of Pfizer, and at that time he was their chief um, medical scientist, says that for every, listen to this, this is really important. He, he's a man of undeniable credibility. He says that for every one child that dies from COVID, guess how many would die from the vaccine? 100. Now, what kind of odds is that to, to march your child off to, to get their vaccine? Oh, but guess what? You don't have to march your child off anymore because the WHO says that just sending your child to public school or to any school um, implies <coughs> consent. Now, how insane is that? I mean, really, who, who, would, who would go along with this? Well, the WHO would, and who do they think they are? Suddenly, people are falling down all over the place and lapping up the most absurd things like the fact that thinking that the who has any kind of authority whatsoever or that the state does to tell you what to do with your children, really. And other, other sources of authority that people are just lapping up. Oh, Bill Gates. Let's see, he's not a doctor. He has his finger in every pie. He has been into eugenics and depopulation for decades and has stated pretty strongly about redu reducing the world population by 10 to 15 percent. That's probably, it's probably being understated when he says that. But everybody just totally accepts that he has his finger in every pie and looks the other way. So anyway, all of this is, a, is part of destabilizing, demoralizing this nation to bring us down so they can bring in tyrannical, beyond ty tyrannical, it's, it's, it's Germany in the 1930s on steroids, folks. We have to wake up to that. Um, so even if this vaccine were perfectly wonderful, government has no right to mandate that or anything else, like the masks, the lockdowns, those are all, that's totally and completely a violation of our, of our constitutional rights. People in general would comply on their own if they wanted to, but we will not comply to <laughs> the absurd and 
genocidal things that are, that are happening in this nation. No, we will call them out as we're doing here today and, and on Tuesday. So as a nation, we're, we're, we're in tough shape. We're in tough shape. You know, what did Ben Franklin say to the woman who said, do you have a, what was it, a monarchy or a republic? And he said, a republic, ma'am, if you can keep it. Can we keep it? With God's help. I, I think that's the only way. You know, the One Bible minute. I've got two more things to say. Where there is the spirit of the Lord, there is liberty. Without it, forget it. So King Asa in Second Chronicles chapter 14, verse 11, was going out to battle against <coughs> unimaginable odds, which is what we're up against. It's like nothing that's ever been seen on the face of the earth before. And he was told by a prophet that he had to always ask for God's help and not to rely on himself or other people. It's not like we, we really have to do everything we can do, everything. But he cried out to the Lord, and Asa cried unto the, under his God and said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on thee, and in thy name we go against this multitude, O Lord. Thou art our God. Let not man prevail against thee. And I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate that we have the opportunity to do this. And I pray that you all um, contemplate deeply that this is a deep spiritual matter that we're dealing with. It's, it's individually, we all, I'm no different than you guys or anybody else. We are all facing huge spiritual in, inward battles. May God help us. Thank you, Thank you Kathleen. <coughs> Our last speaker of the day will be Elliot Axelman. Again, Elliot, because you've already spoken once before, you have five, no more than five minutes. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks for having me back. So, according to the latest statistics, uh, the highest amount of children that have died of COVID over the past year, year, year and a half, is right around 200. So. I thought it was going to be a lot more because of all the propaganda that even I believed a little bit. I thought it was going to be in the thousands, but I looked at all the stats, the AAP, the CDC, right around 200, 250 under 21 year olds have died in the last uh, two years. Um, and because of that number, around 200 kids have died of COVID, we shut down the world like never before in history. First time in history of existence that I know, we shut down schools, locked kids up in the houses and, and put masks on them, and now we're forcing vaccines on them. So, um, you know, if that's reasonable, which almost every politician in the world believes that that was reasonable, I think that it's also reasonable to uh, do every single mitigation strategy for everything that kills more than 200 kids. So if let's say there was something out there that killed 300 or 500 kids a year, we should take every single precaution necessary, even if it means disrupting other uh, quality of life. So for instance, chronic lower respiratory diseases kill 274 kids a year. So to stop all chronic respiratory lower disease like COPD or in kids, uh, maybe CF or other lung disease, let's ban all smoking, mandate air purity filters in every single room in the entire United States, and let's ban all e-cigarettes and vaping. 340 kids die every year of fires and burns. You know, fires and burns in the EMS, it is very, very rare, but 340, so more than COVID. Kids die from fires and burns. I think that you guys should propose a bill next year or amend one of the bills, because it's too late for this year, amend a bill to mandate Every room in New Hampshire have at least one fire extinguisher, and maybe even mandate every kid walk around 24-7 in fireproof, fire uh, retardant clothes, because um, that would save 340 lives. Uh, 599 kids every year die of heart disease. It's probably congenital heart disease. Um, 979 die from congenital anomalies. 982 die from drug overdose and poisoning. Let's ban all poison substances. 995, almost 1,000, way more than COVID, die from drowning. I think we should uh, ban all pools in New Hampshire. Let's propose a bill to ban all pools. Um, I got rid of my pool, so I'm doing my part. And let's mandate water rings, flotation devices on every kid below 21 years old, 24 seven to walk around in case they drown. Because again, that would save more lives than all the mitigation for COVID, right? So uh, 1,430, over 1,000 kids die of suffocation from choking on things every year. So um, let's ban kids from eating small things, I guess. And let's mandate that every single room in New Hampshire have uh, a device to get something out of someone's throat, like a, a life back or maybe advanced airway equipment like intubation or uh, other uh, McGill forceps or something like that. What else? Um, oh, malignant neoplasm, so cancer kills 1,800. As we know, there are things we do to get rid of cancer. 
and over 3,000 kids die in firearm-related injuries. Let's uh, ban all guns, I guess. So I guess all firearms have to be banned if we're going to do everything to save kids. Because again, it would save kids' lives. And over 4,000 kids die every year. The number one killer of kids every year is motor vehicle accidents. Again, EMS for 10 years, I've had a lot of motor vehicle accidents I've treated. Yes, we all know kids do die from it. So let's ban anyone from under 21 years old from being in a car. Um, or, you know, mandate more airbags or let's pass more laws of mandating uh, maybe five seatbelts like a harness for race car drivers and a helmet whenever kids are in a car. Because again, that would save 4,000 lives. And if we're gonna turn, flip the world, like we, we all know we shut down the world for a year, two years, like we've never done before in history of humanity, for to save the max potential benefit was saving around 200 lives a year. And again, every life is important, every death is a tragedy. If we're gonna shut down the world and crash the world economy, biggest crash in the stock market in the world economy in, in history of existence. So the, the whole uh, United States and world markets crashed. If we're gonna do that for, to save 200 lives, to save 4,000 lives, we should ban all cars. So again, even if there's a cost to the mitigation, the cost is worth the benefit, then definitely banning all cars and banning all firearms, banning all foods that cause cancer and heart disease and all the other things, uh, mandating flotation, flotation device for every kid 24 seven, that would save you know hundreds, maybe a few thousand more lives. So I, I I'm expecting to see all those bills proposed next year. So thank you. Thank you, Elliot. I'm assuming a lot of that was sarcasm, but um, is there any questions for Elliot? Thank you, Elliot. This is all the email last night. That's not you, so it's all. All right. That concludes uh, all of the speakers that have asked uh, asked to speak. Or any other, anybody else in the hall who would like to speak? Yep, you can ask a question. Go ahead. Okay, I I, I have a question. Did not the governor um, nullify the emergency situation in New Hampshire, or am I wrong? So I think if your question is around the current mandates through executive order and the, uh, the OSHA rule that was, the emergency OSHA rule that was released, the state of New Hampshire did join on, join on to a federal lawsuit. That federal lawsuit has, um, the judge has issued an injunction stopping that, stopping the um, uh, executive orders and the OSHA rules from going into effect. So the best thing I can say right now is that the, on the federal mandate side, there's currently a pause in play that the uh, in new hampshire in, in new hampshire it includes well, new hampshire why are they promoting the vaccines then okay it's not about it's not about promoting the vaccine it's about mandates so there's a difference there's a differential between those two things well, do, you, do you agree you can a public health official could say they believe vaccines are good but there's a difference between saying public uh, vaccines are good and you must get a vaccine those are two different statements don't you agree one involves choice one involves no choice and the, the fact that the injunction is in play, the, the, which, had, which was against the executive order for federal contractors and people and the uh, OSHA rule, which gave no choice. Well, that, that's the latest one. That's I'm the injunction. The injunction is currently in play. The government. So the injunction is currently in play for that. I'm sorry? So the injunction is stopped that, those, that OSHA rule and the executive order are currently in, in effect. Okay. Also, um, I wanted to say that I heard on the internet that there were 800,000 children between the ages of 5 and 11 that have already been, um, got the gene vaccine in the, in the United States. And also, um, I wanted to add that when the University of Pittsburgh it takes these babies from the mother's womb, and they're, they're full-term babies, when they take the organs out of the, out of the baby, the baby is awake and going through pain, screaming and crying. And they only do this because they want to preserve the blood flow to the organs so that the organs can be sold. And I think that's despicable. I mean, it's just inhuman. So I wanted to clarify that. And um, how, do, how does this committee, um, are the, is the public going to hear from all the people that have written in somehow? Because this is public viewing. So most so of the emails. What about the write-ins? So most of the emails have been forwarded to the committee staffer that's managing the. Um, uh, docket, if you will, right? The, the 
paper, papers we get from citizens go to that go to that person, and they put it in the record, in, <coughs> excuse me, in the file for the for the bill. So all of them be available to um, to be read if somebody wants to. At some point, I think they do digitize them and put them online. I'm not positive of that. I'll be well, honest with you. I, I hope they do that because so, I would like to read but, them. I'm sure, as you can imagine, we have lots of emails on this topic, yeah. um, and so it's go, it'll be it's a pretty very significant step. To hear from the public, yep. and that, that record is also used as part of the court system. So, if someone was to challenge the law, they would go back to see what was submitted and what was presented before the committee, and they'd be able to read all those topics. So, again, we've we've forwarded uh, uh, as many uh, many of the emails through, and I have more I've gotten this morning while we've been having testimony, which I'll forward to the committee researcher, which will be added to the the folder for our, our record. So uh, yes, those, that information it will be made ultimately available for the public. Okay, so if I come next week, I'll be able to read some of their emails. I, will won't, be I don't email? know what their timeline okay. is to get that okay. digitized and into the system. I have no idea. Okay. I, um, again, the vast majority of emails, at least I've received, are uh, opposing the, any, va any mandates. Um, and there's been a very limited number of emails I've received that support the mandate. Okay, thank you for your time and service. Sure, step up to the microphone if you have a question for the committee. Under record, I want to ask the whole committee, each and every one of you, you're under oath, correct? You took an oath to serve we the people, correct? Yes? That's a standard yes. yes That's every, every, off, every, okay. every person takes that. Question I have. If an experimental drug or a vaccine, <laughs> if you want to call it that, if it is FDA approved, and this is a yes or no answer, do all ingredients have to be public? Yes or no? I don't know. All ingredients are public. So they have to be public to be approved, FDA. Okay. So we need transparency on that and someone saying that they, it is public. So it, it, it confuses me how we are even questioning or voting on a mandate of a bioweapon. So for the record, it is not a vaccine. So let's be transparent and let's be honest to all humanity, please. Thank you. Step up to the microphone if you'd like to speak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I read that uh, Rosenwald is on this committee. I'd like to know if that's really true, and if she, if she is, why she's absent today and Monday. I can't speak to why members did not choose to attend the meeting. I have no idea. I believe she's traveling, but I'm not positive. So committee members are not required to be at events like this? Is that committee true? members are appointed. Uh, meetings are, are, are public, and they're supposed to attend. That's all I can tell you. Okay, thank you. All right. Representative Horgan. Oh, thank you. Um, well, first of all, uh, it's not uncommon, especially for senators. There's 24 of them, and there's many committees, so they're, they're quite often not all of them are here. Um, so that's... Um, and also... They're talking about the digitization. My understanding is, I, I can do this as a question if you prefer, but I think my understanding is that in eventually everything that's submitted to every committee gets digitized, but there's a huge backlog. So it, it um, hopefully it'll be digitized right away, but um, we can't really count on it. And my question was, well, I wrote for the question was you mentioned we were talking about um, some number 7,000 from the CDC, which you updated to 15,100, which I guess is still 2% of what I, the um, total number of reported COVID deaths is. But you might, you might want to clarify at some point, I don't know where you can do it now, exactly which, what that number was and where I can find it in the CDC reports. I made an effort looking at my phone to find it, and I didn't know where to look for it. So just. And that's probably something you should, many things you should put in the report. Um, so it comes out on December 1st. So, so they, they answer your question. The data comes for directly from the CDC website, from their, their cumulative death certificate uh, uh, okay. numbers. And if you look at that, it breaks it down by state. In New Hampshire, they reported 33 of those deaths uh, that were reported for COVID were uh, 
self-inflicted injury, injury, or poisonings were actually 33 of the deaths in New Hampshire reported under that category. Okay. Um, so that's a direct CDC statistical number that you can look at and you want to look at the um, conditions. And the Secretary of State's office also has like a, the, what they call the, the vital, vital records database, which probably shows something similar. And Oh, hey, one more question. Um, so the HB 220, I guess, does um, give you the chance to introduce legislation after the hearing and the report are done. Do you have any intention of introducing more legislation or you don't, or is that something you? So as a study committee, the committee has the availability to um, request late drafting and, and it, it's routinely granted for late drafting of bills. But again, as I spoke before, we have 32 bills on the, to on the various <laughs> topics. We'd probably be more inclined to recommend an amendment to an existing bill yep. to cover any of the, um, <clears throat> at least I'm speaking for myself, yep. I'd be more inclined to recommend amendments to the bills that are going in if we think there's a topic that's come out of this committee that needs uh, action and we'd, we'd repurpose one of the existing bills or add on to one of the existing bills. Yeah, good idea, given there's, in addition to those 32 bills, there's, I think, 842 other bills. I think there's 70, 765 bills, if I'm not mistaken. All right, thanks, thanks. Further questions for the committee? Yes, one uh, real quick comment. Um, we hear a lot, uh, we've heard a lot this morning about medical exemptions. This right here is our exemption. Under the Constitution, which you all swore to uphold, we the people. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you for taking questions. This is so refreshing compared to school board meetings. <laughs> um, I have a question. I don't have a copy of the bill in front of me, but I'm going to reference what stuck in my head when another speaker spoke. Um, that the bill is in reference to immunizations and medical interventions. Would a medical intervention include the masking because it's being used as a medical device and give us back our rights over our children's to use or not use a medical device in schools? Since so it's being forced? I'm going to pass this over to Erica, uh, Representative Leon. I think we had a we had a definition in one of the one of the meetings. They talked about what medical intervention was and talking about treatment and procedures. And I'm trying I don't recall the exact language I used. I'm hoping maybe she remembers. There are many definitions of medical interventions. Um, there's more of a focus on those that are invasive, so they cross the body barrier. So whether it's an injection, whether it's a blood, uh, blood draw, whether it's something that goes through a natural orifice, um, because it's a hard thing to define, and um, you have to draw a line at some point. And it, at this point, there is a difference between something you can take off and something that you can't. So is there anything then coming down the pipeline to help parents to get back, gain back control over our medical decisions because right now the schools are making medical decisions for our children that many of us don't agree with. There are several bills that have been filed for that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Any Mr. other Chair? questions? Uh, I'm sorry? Chair? If it's brief, I, we, uh, uh, Mr. Chair? Isn't it true? that the Constitution is the highest law in the land and that our rights are unalienable. And so parents haven't lost their rights. They've given them up, perhaps, by not knowing that they can't lose them and that their rights are being unconstitutionally violated and taken from them. They have not lost their rights. Isn't that true? I, I don't know how to answer your question, ma'am. I'm sorry? I don't know how to answer your question. So the question is, so that's probably the best answer I give. I don't know the answer to your question. Well, so. it would be good, a really good thing to look into because I know the answer to the question. Well, I, I can probably tell you that the federal lawsuit that's currently pending asked that one of those exact questions, whether or not it's a fundamental rights issue to begin with. <laughs> well, the Constitution means what it says, and we have not lost our rights. Great. Thank you. I just wondered how many members are on this committee? There's six. The, it's currently Senator Rosenwald is the only one that's missing. Okay. All right. Thank you. Last comment on the question of the day. Mr. Lang, it's more uh, personal. So I have a child who is in her 30s, works at Concord Hospital. She, like me, has comorbidities. I will not be getting this shot. And I have my own 
personal reasons for it, and the Constitution supports me in that choice, or it should. Luckily, I'm a housewife, so I'm not being mandated by my employer or the state. But my child, who works at Concord Hospital, was told by a certain date she had to submit an exemption or a cho you know something to let them make the decision for her about whether she was going to do this thing. Medically, she has comorbidities. She literally has half her organs because I am a type one diabetic. And one of the things that I passed on to my child is the fact that she doesn't have all of her organs. So she had to submit a medical exemption, but she went to her primary in Franklin, and this doctor literally told her, I cannot write you a medical exemption or I will lose my physician capability. I cannot do it. The, my over, the people above the doctor are telling her she can't have her job or take care of her patients if she writes my daughter a reason to not medically get out of this injection. Wrong, so wrong, but, so she decides since she's gone to the doctor, paid for a visit, had her primary and her have a full conversation where the doctor is literally apologizing to her that she can't do what she knows she should do because if she does it, she's got no job. So my daughter walks out, calls me after and is like, mom, she can't write me one. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You have half your organs. She knows it's not safe. Yeah, my only other option is to do the religious exemption. We are Christian family. We attend church. We have our beliefs from the Bible. So I tell her, well, go ahead and try to submit it. She ends up leaving the hospital because she's so afraid that on that day that they're going to make her do it, that she looks for other work. And I'm telling her, hold on, hold on, because maybe this will all change before that day comes, right? So she submits for the religious exemption. She leaves the hospital. Luckily, she had many opportunities, because she's a very good candidate to, in her field, to find other work. She found other work that didn't require this to come down on her. She leaves her job that she loved, and she goes to this other job. She's working it for a little while, and she gets the notification weeks later that they've accepted her religious exemption. Oh, well, that, first of all, shouldn't have been something she should have had to submit in the first place, because that is an individual choice as well. I will tell you another thing, that my son attends the same district that you live in, and this morning, I had to call the principal of the Winnesquam Middle School and tell them my son will not be attending school and that they had better get him an education that is adequate even though I'll be keep, keeping him home because he's not wearing a mask because my son, who will not be getting this either over my dead body, had heart surgery at Boston Children's at five days old. I am not putting this bioweapon which we don't know what it does other than the myocarditis, which is hugely fearful for me. I've talked to my doctor about every vaccine that m my family has had, raising my daughter and raising my son. I am not an anti-vaxxer. I've had all my vaccines. My son has attended public school. He's had all his vaccines that are mandated for him to attend. From now on, he will be religiously exempting out of any future vaccines from this country that says that he should have one. To attend school, to attend anything. And I'm telling you that you guys need to listen to your constituents, all of them, not just the ones that are fearful. I'm fearful too, but I had COVID. I'm immune. My child who worked at the hospital had COVID, had to prove she didn't, that she was healthy and had the strength to go back to work at that hospital. And they still didn't take anything but a religious exemption 
as her reason for being, now she's back to work. They, she went back to the hospital after all of that. They accepted her back gladly because she was a good employee. I just, you guys have got to look to everybody for, there's reasons people don't do these things. And you don't, I wouldn't take a vaccine if it was going to mean that it was going to react differently with my insulin because that insulin keeps me alive. <coughs> I, if I didn't have it in my body right now, I'd be dead, right? You guys can't just look at one thing and think it's not okay. If I was an employed person and I chose to not get it, I, I lose my house, I lose everything I've worked my whole life for. It's not okay. Just not okay. I'm sorry, I got emotional, but thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your comment. Question? So, a real question? Yes, sir. Go I'll ahead. Be this time. Um, do you guys have any idea who's going to be held liable eventually when, in a few years, inevitably, um, we have kids or adults as well who are, have some mild to moderate uh, brain or other injuries from chronic hypoxia, which is low oxygen, and chronic hypercapnia, which is high CO2. Uh, there have been some studies of uh, chronic hypoxia in regards to COPD, and overall it could uh, increase hemoglobin as well, which can cause more clots, but also overall if your oxygen saturation is a little low, not dying, but if it's a little low, like 90, 95, 90, 85, you get some brain fog and anxiety and eventually some memory loss. And from this two year long experiment of wearing masks 24 seven, and uh, same with high CO2 can also cause a little bit of brain damage, not like super severe MR or whatever, but it can cause some memory loss, anxiety, some uh, slow reflexes and, and overall a little bit of brain damage. In a few years, I'm afraid we're gonna see some of that because not me, but some wear masks 24 seven and it absolutely does decrease oxygen and increase CO2. Do you know who's gonna be liable? Will we be able to sue the government for mandating and, and coercing us to take, you know, put on masks or the uh, school boards or businesses who force masks? So that's my first question, I'd love an answer to it. And the second one is, is, someone mentioned that doctors are losing licenses and you know, some doctors throughout the United States because of the AMA and all the board certifications for attendings for different specialties are revoking the uh, board certifications for doctors who don't speak highly positively of the vaccine or who oppose coronafascism. As a, a paramedic, without my paramedic card, I can't earn money um, you know, from being a medic. Do you, do you guys plan as state reps or other state reps to revoke my license if I don't endorse the vaccine or endorse coronafascism and that would take on my livelihood, and that would be you know, another question I would love to answer for. Thanks. Sure. So answer you two questions. The first one being is there are several bills submitted relative to liability uh, on COVID, and whether there's business liability, whether there's governmental li liability, or whether there's individual liability, and where that – I think there's at least three bills on, on – um, liability as it relates to exposure to COVID or, expo or the mandates that have been pushed down. Secondarily, to answer your, your, your second question there, the on the licensure. So um, there's no bill somewhere that talk about licensure for doctors relative to being suspended. So that would be a, a policy or regulation that's dealt with in the Board of Medicine. Um, on their regulatory requirements for um, licensure. So, but there are no currently no bills to address that, that I'm aware of. All right, that be done. We're gonna go into recess um, real quick, uh, but before the committee members leave, I guess I, we're gonna meet in, in State House 103. Uh, how long do we wanna take a break for before we come back? I'm hoping we can have a good committee work session and not be very long at all. I've, I've, I've worked up some draft language. I'll get printed out, and so each member has a copy of some draft language, and we can talk about the draft language and see if there's anything that really needs to be done. Um, So we're going to meet in State House 103. We'll take a 15-minute break to give us bio break, use the restroom, that kind of thing. Ten minutes. Ten-minute break. So we'll meet down there at 1210 um, in State House Room 103 where the committee will begin some deliberations and discussions around the committee report that will be a result of this hearing. Thank you. God bless you.